Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Bahia, as if I human right ambassador of the Netherlands for accepting to moderate this session. My good friend, what Sara Astova, president of UNESCO, uh, of United Nations Economic Social Council, Madame Azoulay, Director General of UNESCO, Excellencies. Ladies and gentlemen, it is a great pleasure to participate in the celebration of the World Press Freedom Day at the UN headquarters. The theme of this special anniversary, Shaping a Future of Rights, is an invitation to look at the past as we build new foundations for resilience and peace. When we move forward in the, in the last decade of action for the implementation of the UN Sustainable Development Agenda, it becomes, it becomes more and more clear that press freedom and right to information must be at the heart of every society that aims at strengthening the rule of law and promoting human rights. 75 years ago, Article 19 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights stated, everyone has the right to freedom of expression and opinion. The right, this right includes freedom to hold opinion without interference and to seek, receive, and impart information and ideas through any media and regardless of frontiers. Since then, the world, as we know, has undergone deep transformation. But these lines have not aged one day. Freedom of information and freedom of expression refers to human need for communication and understanding. They must be protected as ramparts for all other human rights. And yet, in these last years, they have increasingly been target of attacks online and offline. It is true that modern digital technologies have created new possibilities for freedom of expression, improving access, production, and sharing of information, but it also pose risk to social fabrics through the dissemination of disinformation and hate speeches. And though the use of chatbots demonstrate the great potential of artificial intelligence for supporting human ingenuity, it also calls for better transparency of new technologies company, companies regarding protection and privacy and the dissemination of information. Critical thinking and the exchange of ideas through dialogue remain indeed essential to ensure the diversity of views and opinion. This is why we need more than ever to ensure the respect of press freedoms. Journalism is one of the most important activity for the protection of citizens and consolidation of just and inclusive societies. It is essential to empower individuals to make informed decisions about the, their future by providing access to reliable information and reinforcing trust. It is in this spirit that in 1993, the UN General Assembly, based on a resolution from UNESCO General Conference, proclaimed 3 May as the World Press Freedom Day to raise awareness of the importance of freedom of the press and remind government of their duty to respect and uphold the right to freedom of expression. And still today, journalism continues to be one of the most dangerous professions in the world. Media and press freedom has been treated not only by physical threat, not only by physical violence, but by the blocking of online services, the piracy of websites, and the piracy-related attacks. Most than ever, we need to scale up efforts to change this course. In response, some positive initiatives have been undertaken at the multilateral level. The UN plan 
for the safety of journalists that completed last year 10th, its 10th anniversary, has become an important instrument to improve work towards the creation of a free and protected environment for journalists and media workers. More recently, in 2021, the General Conference, in the General of Conference of UNESCO, member states also renewed their engagement to promote freedom of expression by endorsing the principles of Windhoek 30 declaration that establish information as a public good. It is in this spirit that UNESCO is using the force of its mandate to work to strengthen worldwide freedom of expression. As many of the initiatives that we heard this morning, Director General say uh, uh, this, the Director General of our UNESCO, Madame Azoulay, has strongly advocated for integrated media and information literacy as part of the education efforts of all society to allow citizens to fully enjoy the right to freedom of expression using their critical capacity in a responsible, responsible manner. And last year, for the first time, first time ever, I issued a joint declaration with the former president of the United Nations General Assembly and the Human Rights Council to raise awareness of the importance of ensuring journalists with the safe conditions to work freely and independently. As president of UNESCO General Conference, I firmly believe that the United Nations entity must continue to join forces to ensure the respect for freedom of expression and information as guarantors of other human rights. This is why this time, together not only with the President of the United Nations General Assembly and the Human Rights Council, but also the President of ECOSOC, we have taken the initiative to publish a new joint statement on the occasion of the 30th anniversary of the World Press Freedom Day, calling for promoting, protecting, and fulfilling the rights of freedom of opinion and expression as a, as a human right guarantee to all. At the United Nations, indicted, <clears throat> as the United Nations entity responsible for freedom of expression, UNESCO must continue with the support of member states and other UN entities to strengthen dialogue, to advance policies and laws that safeguard the media for interference and threats while protecting universal access to in information. Thank you very much. Obrigado. Thank you, Your Excellency, for your empowering and inspiring words, your organization's leadership in promoting and defending uh, press freedom all around the world, and UNESCO's convening power in bringing us all here together at the UN General Assembly Hall. Now, next we will move to the second speaker, the esteemed speaker from the UN Economic Social Council, Her Excellency La Cesara Stoefa. Thank you, Madam Moderator, Ministers, UNESCO Director General, President of the General Conference of UNESCO, dear ladies and gentlemen, dear guests, it is an honor to be here with you today to mark the 30th anniversary of the proclamation of the World Press Freedom Day by the General Assembly. It actually all started with the, uh, with the resolution by the Economic and Social Council adopted on 20th of July 1993 on the promotion of press freedom in the world, which at the time was co-sponsored by Benin, France, Mauritius, and Slovakia. This resolution recommended to the General Assembly that um, the declaration of 3rd of May as World Press Freedom Day and recognized that a free, pluralistic, and independent press is an essential component of any democratic society. Today, 30 years later, those words are more valid than ever. In a time when freedom of expression and the safety of journalists is under constant attack, when the civic spaces are steadily shrinking, 
It is more important than ever to send a strong and united signal in defense of uncensored and unhindered news media and the rights of journalists and media workers to work safely and without fear. This is what we are doing today with this joint statement, which underlines the fundamental connection between freedom of expression as a driver for all other human rights. All human rights are indivisible and interdependent. One set of rights can never be enjoyed fully without the others. Without freedom of expression, all other human rights are a jeopardy. When we cannot access verified and independent information, democratic elections can no longer be guaranteed. Speech, uh, hate speech and division can thrive, and polarization is often amplified through concerted disinformation campaigns. Without freedom of expression, we cannot enjoy our right to education, to health, children's and women's rights, our right to participation in cultural life, or our right to a safe, clean, healthy and sustainable environment. Uh, as the Economic and Social Council of the United Nations, it is our role to foster debates, innovative thinking and to forge consensus on ways to advance sustainable development. We coordinate with different stakeholders to work together to achieve the Sustainable Development Goals. The UN Plan of Action on the Safety of Journalists and the Issue of Impunity, which is coordinated by UNESCO and the Office of the Commissioner for Human Rights, is also built on exactly the idea of fostering partnerships and multi-stakeholderism in order to advance a safer and more enabling environment for journalists. ECOSOC works with more than 3,200 non-governmental organizations across the world. It is often these organizations that are the voices of the local communities and, they, and that play an indispensable role in calling for and driving societal changes. All of us, from the UN system, regional organizations, to civil society, governments, academia, the media and all concerned actors have a responsibility in making a future of rights a reality. In concluding, I would like to pay special tribute to all those journalists who are literally risking their lives on a daily basis to ensure our access to verified and independent information. Your courage and dedication are inspiring. We need you and we are grateful to you. To paraphrase the words attributed to Voltaire, we may not agree with what you have to say, but we should and will defend to the death your right to say it. Thank you. Thank you, Your Excellency, for presenting this important and uplifting perspective from ECOSOC. Next, we'll watch a video message. It's a video message by His Excellency, Mr. Vaklev Balik, President of the UN Human Rights Council. Distinguished speakers, excellencies, dear participants, thank you for inviting me and for engaging the Human Rights Council. I'm glad that the World Press Freedom Day brings us together despite the physical distance. It is an honor to speak to you on the 30th anniversary of the World Press Freedom Day. This year's theme, Shaping a Future of Rights, Freedom of Expression as a Driver for All Other Human Rights, shows that freedom of expression is not about some special privileges. On the contrary, it is about protection and promotion of all human rights. This is also one of the key messages of our joint statement. Freedom of expression, and more particularly, media freedom, are a driver of human rights, such as the right to access information, the right to participate in public life, or the right to hold those in power accountable. When we talk about these human rights, it is good to remember that we talk about actual persons, journalists, media workers, or civil society actors. The Human Rights Council recognizes the crucial role of all those promoting and defending media freedom. Sadly, it is a fact that attacks on media freedom continue to take place. Journalists and media workers are being arrested, harassed, and even killed for simply doing their jobs. Media outlets are being censored, shut down, or restricted online as well as offline. These actions not only harm individual journalists and media organizations, but also erode the foundations of free and democratic societies. And the Human Rights Council deplores this worrying trend. We do not only express our concerns, 
FIDU Act. Through its mandate, the Human Rights Council has a responsibility to monitor and document abuses of media freedom and to hold accountable those who commit such abuses. It does so through ad the adoption of specific resolutions, such as the one on the safety of journalists. It also requests the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights to report on abuses. It sets up investigative bodies and works with special procedures, including the UN Special Reporter on Freedom of Opinion and Expression and with civil society. It also supports work aimed at media literacy and education. All this can have a meaningful impact only if it reaches beyond our respective organizations. And this is why I support and welcome the joint initiative and cooperation led by UNESCO. Excellencies, dear participants, on this World Press Freedom Day, let me assure you that you can count on my support and the one of the Human Rights Council. Member States of the Human Rights Council are committed to working with you to promote and protect media freedom for all. Thank you for involving the Human Rights Council and congratulations on the successful event. It's wonderful that we had a video message from the UN president, uh, president of the UN Human Rights Council, also reinforcing the connection between press freedom and all other human rights. The collective voices of the three presidents, which we heard today, conveys a strong message to the world that multilateralism and freedom of expression are fundamental to shaping a future of rights, a future where everyone can enjoy their human rights. I believe it is important to involve and empower young people to contribute to the achievement of this important goal. Youth want to have a voice in decisions that affect them because what we do and decide today directly impacts their lives and future of rights. As the UN Secretary General said in his report, our common agenda, and I quote, now is the time to deliver more for young people and succeeding generations, and to be better prepared for the challenges ahead." Unquote. Mindful of time, I need to move towards the end of this empowering session. And I would like to thank again the three presidents for contributing and sharing their strong and dedicated commitment to promote and defend press freedom, the safety of journalists, and human rights all around the world. It is clear that we need to increase our collective commitment and our multi-stakeholder and intergenerational collaboration to improve press freedom. Journalists supply the oxygen of free, informed, and healthy societies, and they must simply be safe at all times to do their vital work. So thank you, everyone. And I'll now hand back to our wonderful Master of Ceremonies, Michelle. Thank you. Ambassador, thank you so much. Uh, also, thank you very much to Your Excellencies. And now it is an honor to welcome to the stage Samantha Power, Administrator of USAID. She is no stranger here because, of course, from 2013 to 2017, Power served as the 28th US Permanent Representative to the United Nations. She is a Pulitzer Prize winning author, a former journalist, and war correspondent, and prior to joining the Biden-Harris administration, Ms. Power was the Anne Lind Professor of the Practice of Global Leadership and Public Policy at the Harvard Kennedy School, and the William D. Zabel Professor of Practice in Human Rights at Harvard Law School. And now, Ambassador Power, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. It's uh, great to be back in this momentous chamber, and, and thanks to Michelle uh, for emceeing today and for that introduction. Thank you also to the UNESCO Director General, Audrey Azoulay, uh, for inviting me uh, to be part of this great event today and for leading UNESCO's efforts to protect culture and education. From rebuilding Mosul's old city to rehabilitating schools in Beirut after the 2020 blast. 
It's partly because of UNESCO that World Press Freedom Day exists. As many of you know, May 3 honors the anniversary of the Windhoek De Declaration, produced in 1991 by African journalists attending a UNESCO seminar on press freedom in Namibia. They wrote that, quote, an independent, pluralistic, and free press is essential to the development and maintenance of democracy, end quote. But back then, as is true today, being a journalist took immense courage. Their work could bring them face to face with the worst of humanity and sometimes place them in the crosshairs of violence. So 30 years ago, the United Nations General Assembly created World Press Freedom Day to honor that courage and call on the world to protect journalists from the threats that they face. At that very moment, thousands of miles away, I was about to experience analogous threats firsthand. I had just published my first story in print as a reporter uh, in US News and World Report on a safe, heri safe area uh, in northwestern Bosnia. I was preparing to move to Bosnia to cover the war as a stringer. While other journalists, especially Bosnian journalists, faced far greater threats than I, I still remember the close calls of those years, the shrapnel bursting through the window of an apartment where I was typing up my story, the mortar attack that flattened uh, a house just a few doors down, the snipers who targeted us as we roamed around the city of Sarajevo uh, in search of interviews, trying to tell the story of a people being besieged. I made it home unscathed. I was incredibly lucky. But I had close friends who were targeted and kidnapped in the line of duty. When I returned to Bosnia and Herzegovina last year as US aid administrator, I spoke with the editor-in-chief at the Sarajevo Daily, Oslo Bajenja. Oslo Bajenja published the news every single day throughout the three and a half year siege of Sarajevo, even when their building was bombed and reduced to rubble in 1992. The, the paper, Oslo Bajenja, became a symbol of courage and resilience around the world. Yet, this editor told me, I lived through the war. I reported on it every day. And the threats I am facing as a journalist today are so much greater than what I faced back then. That is what she said last year. So much greater that, than what she faced back then. And back then was a war, a full-fledged war. For many of you journalists who are here in the audience or watching online, her words probably resonate. Since 1993, the number of journalists detained or arrested has more than tripled. Most recently, with Evan Gershkovich's wrongful, deplorable detention by the Russian Federation. Putin is targeting journalists elsewhere as well, like in Ukraine, where his forces have shelled broadcasting towers, seized editorial offices, and killed nine journalists since last February 24th. All told, at least 67 news workers around the world were killed last year, nearly a 50% increase from the year before. And perpetrators of such crimes are rarely brought to justice, making it likely that these trends will continue. USAID, the agency I'm now privileged to serve as administrator at, has long worked to protect journalists around the globe. In Burma, which is the world's third worst jailer of journalists, we are helping threatened newsrooms relocate to safer locations and providing digital security training to journalists and sources at risk of online attacks. When Putin invaded Ukraine, we provided journalists with flak jackets, helmets, and satellite phones. And in Mexico, which saw at least 13 journalists killed last year, USAID is helping prosecutors develop case management systems and investigative techniques to bring perpetrators to justice. But for today's journalists and media organizations, staying in business is another growing challenge. 
Today, nearly three quarters of internet users in the European Union, for example, get their news online. And social media is a leading news source from Kenya to Chile to Malaysia. Journalists compete for every story and outlets for every ad dollar, not just with other outlets, but with tech giants like Facebook and Google, which in 2022 captured nearly half of global digital advertising revenue. As a result, thousands of independent news outlets have shut down. In this country, the United States alone, roughly two a week have shut down since the COVID pandemic began. This is something that some are calling a media extinction event. Other news organizations are propped up or taken over by repressive or self-serving elites. They are often repurposed to spread propaganda. When this happens, people tend to get their information either from state-funded outlets, which have incentives or sometimes even directives to spread propaganda, or from social media, where disinformation can run rampant. Autocrats and extremists thrive in this media landscape. Democracies do not. Today, USAID is bringing in new partners to help us prevent media extinction events. At the last Summit for Democracy, which President Biden chaired, we welcomed Microsoft into a three-way partnership with Internews to create something called a Media Viability Accelerator. This will expand access to media market research and help smaller media organizations access data on media markets, shift their business models to digital first, and produce engaging content to attract new audiences. News outlets can't be truly independent if they are financially dependent on government or donor funding. But a more insidious threat, even, is growing. Legal attacks, or what we might call lawfare. When I spoke with a group of journalists during my first week at USAID, they actually identified lawsuits for libel, defamation, copyright infringement, and other charges as the biggest impediment to their work. Such lawsuits can be devastating. In Serbia, the investigative outlet Crick has exposed several corruption schemes, an impressive feat given that the organization has an operating budget in the hundreds of thousands of dollars. But since 2021, Crick has faced 12 lawsuits. For Crick, I want to stress that is actually more lawsuits than they have employees. And the damages totaled three times the organization's annual budget three times. To withstand lawfare, journalists and media outlets need robust protection. They need training in how to avoid lawsuits altogether. They need resources to hire lawyers and cover legal fees. But often, journalists cannot get these protections. Many independent outlets can't afford to be sued. So they are driven out of business, or they try to self-censor to avoid attracting the interest of those who might target them. And corrupt leaders know all this, which is why they are using lawfare more and more. With one recent survey finding that nearly half of journalists who responded to the survey questions were facing or had faced legal threats. For years, repressive or corrupt elites have tried to silence opposition, we all know, by killing journalists. Now, they are trying to kill journalism. To protect journalists and journalism, USAID has partnered with the Organized Crime and Corruption Reporting Project and the Cyrus R. Vance Center, as well as law firms offering pro bono support to create something which I hope you will go forth and talk about called Reporter's Shield. Reporter's Shield is an innovative new program to defend investigative reporters and civil society advocates from lawsuits that are meant to drive them out of business or to deter their hard-hitting reporting. 
Reporter Shield covers the cost of legal defense for journalists, civil society activists, and organizations battling lawsuits meant to silence their reporting or their investigations. Reporter Shield is more than a legal protection program. It will also help journalists avoid lawsuits by providing resources for pre-publication legal review. And it will connect journalists with qualified lawyers to help them navigate the legal process. Now, today, I am pleased to announce that starting immediately, media outlets and civil society organizations around the world can apply to the program to cover their reporters and their staff members. Applications will be reviewed in phases, with journalists in some regions able to receive benefits as early as next month, what with other regions launching later this year and in 2024. You can find more information and apply to the program on reporters-shield.org, reporters-shield.org. Reporter Shield is going to, go str is going to grow stronger as more individuals and organizations join us in supporting it, whether that is through funding or providing pro bono legal support. So please, I would appeal to you to raise awareness of this new initiative, Reporter Shield. I urge everyone to join us in protecting journalism against threats, both well-worn threats and these newer threats. I urge everyone to hold accountable those that murder and imprison news workers, to financially support independent media organizations, as citizens to consume the important content that these independent media organizations produce, to help reporters defend themselves against lawfare. In doing so, in doing any one of these things, you will help our broader effort to build a world where reporters need not be so brave, where their work must stand up only to counter arguments rather than bankruptcy or bailiffs or bullets, where they don't need protection just for reporting the news, because in the words of the Windhoek Declaration, only when journalists are truly free can democracy thrive. Thank you so much. Thank you very much to Administrator Power, and we're going to be hearing more about that new initiative, the Reporter's Shield, in our last panel a little bit later on. Throughout the day, we've heard from journalists, human rights defenders, civil society and institutions on their work to protect human rights and the role of freedom of expression in promoting them. We will now delve deeper into some of the points that State Administrator Power just touched on and in a session that will bring together representatives of three countries that are taking coordinated, concerted efforts to protect those that risk their lives in holding the powerful accountable and fighting for change. And with that, let me bring to the stage Abdurrahim Fukara, who is the Bureau Chief of Al Jazeera in Washington, D.C. Good evening, everyone. Good afternoon, good morning, whatever the time you choose to be. Uh, it gives me great pleasure to be a, a part of uh, these proceedings. Uh, thank you to uh, uh, UNESCO. It gives me also great pleasure to introduce to you now, without further ado, um, Anna Lohmann, who is State Minister in the Federal Foreign Office of Germany. Excellencies, colleagues and delegates, a couple of days ago, this year's World Press Photo Awards were announced. The pictures resonate deeply with us, with the viewers. I would like to focus on two. First, the global winner image by Jevigeni Maloletka, a deeply touching photography that cap captures the last hours 
in the life of Irina Kalinina. A pregnant woman being carried away from a maternity hospital by Ukrainian soldiers in the city of Mariupol after being hit by a reckless Russian airstrike on the local hospital. Her baby Miron, named after the word peace, soon after died, unborn. Half an hour later, both were dead. This image tells us about the unconceivable horrors civilians must endure in war. It is a testimony to the brutal violence that Russia has imposed on the lives of people in Ukraine, the harsh realities ingrained in the body of a mother and an unborn child. The second image I would like to mention was taken by Mauk Kamva, a photographer from Myanmar. Kamva has been covering the guerrilla war in Myanmar from inside this country for a year. This image shows a guerrilla fighter carrying the dead body of a comrade who had been fighting against the military dictatorship in Myanmar. It is a stark reminder of the persistent violence in an almost forgotten conflict. It shows the hardship of people struggling for democracy in face of a brutal military dictatorship. Continuing the work as a photographer and thereby informing the world about what is happening inside Myanmar is an act of enormous courage. The courage becomes even more evident when seen against the background that according to Reporters Without Borders, Myanmar is the most dangerous country for journalists worldwide. These are two images which are almost unbearable to look at. Two mo moments that only receive global attention due to the work of very courageous photojournalists. Photojournalists willing to take tremendous personal risks in order to capture essential moments and share them with the world. Their valuable work helps us to grasp the realities of people living in armed conflicts and under oppression. The images go beyond mere numbers. They provide access to remote spots and they make the situation on the ground really feelable and palatable for everyone. They help us also in our political decision making. And they tell the world about moments that otherwise would be forgotten. The women and men behind the camera really deserve our highest recognition and solidarity. Ladies and gentlemen, allow me also a, a very personal uh, remark. As a researcher, I have spent years searching for early warning indicators for democratic decline. And these are attacks on media freedom. Once media freedom is attacked, other freedoms get under pressure as well. Media freedom is a central pillar of democracy. It is therefore highly concerning that spaces for critical journalism are shrinking, that information deserts and risks for journalists increase. We should pay tribute to the remarkable efforts made by journalists who continue to work in such challenging contexts. Journalists committed to their profession are taking tremendous personal risks to document realities in conflict, crisis, and under repression. Germany has therefore made it a priority to develop a new protection program for journalists in conflict and crisis, the Hannah Arendt Initiative. Hannah Arendt was a remarkable Jewish, German, US, American intellectual who herself had to flee from Nazi Germany and find heaven here in New York. Hannah Arendt was a convinced defender of freedom and democracy. Through the Hannah Arendt Initiative, we have been supporting about a thousand journalists in the continuation of their work. Journalists like Mauk Kamwa from Myanmar. In 2022, we invested more than 7 million euros in this effort and we will further substantially steep up our support. We do so in solidarity with journalists from Ukraine, but also with those who have critically reported from within Russia and Belarus and who had therefore to flee their country. Furthermore, we have been supporting journalists from countries like Afghanistan, like Iran, like Myanmar. Within the Hannah Arendt initiatives, journalists play a key role in strengthening spaces for free speech and independent journalism in their countries of origin. 
Recognizing the importance of a systemic and coordinated approach to the matter, we have been liaising with numerous partners and friends. These include, of course, UNESCO as a key agency in this joint international effort, as well as member states of the Media Freedom Coalition. Our common goal is the strengthening of the resilience of journalists in their work, both in their countries of origin as well as in exile. Therefore, let me close by reaffirming Germany's strong commitment towards the UN Plan of Action for the Safety of Journalists and the resolution, the safety of journalists, adopted by the Human Rights Council last October. Let me recall Article 19 of the UN Declaration of Human Rights, which is the guiding principle of Germany's media freedom policy. Everyone has the right to freedom of opinion and expression. This article guarantees press freedom. Press freedom is a fundamental pillar of a democratic and pluralist society. This is why Germany stands firmly against any violation of press freedom. This is also why Germany supports journalists suffering from shrinking spaces worldwide. Let me close with the words of Hannah Arendt. The moment we no longer have a free press, anything can happen. Therefore, I'm very glad that we gather here today to reaffirm our commitment to the important principle of media freedom. Thank you. Thank you very much for those words. And joining you on stage, let me introduce Her Excellency Camila Vallejo, Minister General Secretariat of the Government of Chile. His Excellency Thomas Gerber, Deputy State Secretary, Federal Department of Foreign Affairs of Switzerland. And your moderator again, Abdel Rahim. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you, Michelle. Thank you. Uh, um to all the panelists, uh, I wanted to, since you've just spoken, uh, I wanted to actually start uh, 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 with you, uh, Minister Lumen. The current uh, coalition government in uh, your country, in Germany, launched the, uh, the Hannah Arendt Initiative, basically for supporting freedom of the press in places like Ukraine, Afghanistan, and so on. Um, do you want to tell us a little bit more about that, that uh, initiative? And also, if you could touch on the results that the initiative has had so far since 2022. Thank you. Yes, indeed. Um, it's a very important initiative that we launched to support journalists that have come under uh, attack. Um, and we try first to support them within their home countries so that they continue, can continue working there. If this is not possible, um, then uh, we try to find uh, regional um, places, regional hubs close to their home countries where they can continue work and continue provide information and um, journalistic work uh, to the constituents in their home country. If that doesn't work, also uh, some are relocated to Germany and continue to work from there. And I emphasize this um, uh, so much that they continue to work because this is also when you speak to journalists, some of them are, are here today that had to flee their country of origin. Most of them want to continue their important work and want to continue shedding a light on the important issues that concern uh, their countries. I recently had a conversation with a journalist from Afghanistan and the ma main issue she cared about was how she can continue to actually reach out to uh, particularly the women and girls that are, are still in Afghanistan. So we are trying to support them with um, financial means, but also with um, the infrastructure that they need in order to do so. And until now, we have supported about a thousand journalists. Okay. Um, let me turn uh, to the gentleman here on my left, uh, Minister State uh, um, Deputy State Secretary of uh, Foreign Ministry in uh, uh, Switzerland. Um, freedom of the press is part of Swiss foreign policy. Tell us a little bit about that in whatever language you choose. I know that you're a man of many different tongues. Please go ahead. Merci beaucoup, uh, Excellence, uh, Mesdames et Messieurs. Very much, Excellencies. I want to first uh, 
pass on the best wishes from Ilya Tuskasis, our Minister of Foreign Affairs, who was unable to come here and invited me to represent to Switzerland for him here on this occasion. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, how many wars have started because of false information? How many conflicts? are nourished by a propaganda against individuals or a nation. I am convinced that each and every one of the people here uh, remember more tr than one traumatic event that was created before because of a lack of good information. It, during today's World Press Freedom Day, it is important to remember the essential role of the freedom of press and of the media in the Declaration of the Human Rights and Democracy and a Sustainable Development Goal and Maintaining of Peace. It is only when media and civil society can demand and uh, promote uh, information on disinformation that everything can be transparent and government can be held accountable uh, in an efficient way. Unfortunately, uh, we must note that access to independent information and of quality is uh, more and more threatened all over the world. The professionals in the media world of media are often intimidated, aggressed, uh, har harassed, and uh, more than that, disinformation and misinformation and propagation at large scale of lies or fake news is intensifying. The closing of partial or complete internet access happens more and more. If access to information, reliable information, and important information in time of peace exists, it is vital during conflicts and wars. It, it allows individuals to find the for individuals who are in conflict zones to make good decision for their safety and the ones of their family uh, and their loved ones. Uh, however, disinformation spreads hatred and confusion and uh, exer uh, more, uh, although there is the work of humanitarian organization, it uh, puts uh, the personal um, in danger and the efforts for supporting these um, minorities is m difficult. Uh, I remind you that the role of the media is essential to be able to transmit, to pass on information of good quality. Professionals of the media must be able to do their work freely without being intimidated. They must be protected and respected, even in conflict zones, armed conflict zones. Their contribution uh, to verified information and reliable information is fundamental. Their work is uh, uh, demand in, is important in front of fake news increasing in a number that polarize the society and nourish uh, uh, the hatred for the other. For us, for all of us, we have to offer the conditions, favorable conditions for medias and professionals of the media so they can create their analysis on independent and varied information uh, platforms. It is it, de it depends on us to uh, encourage debate and respecting diverging opinions. And it is on us, all of us, to reinforce resilience of ci citizens in front of fake news. And this starts with school, primary school. And this is where Switzerland and uh, DMC reminded me to speak about the link between uh, 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 Switzerland's foreign policy and uh, freedom of press. This is how we're going to publish our first action plan for security of uh, journalists and media workers. We have four goals. 
The first is a better recognition of their role in media and their power. A better second, a better protection against their against hatred speech in online. Thirdly, a better protection, a physical protection, because often it is very important, uh, among other things, during protest. And fourth, a better understanding of the abusive process lawsuits uh, against them. Switzerland demonstrates, therefore, thereby, uh, that it recognizes the importance of journalists and professionals in the media field. Ladies and gentlemen, when rise to free e expression, freedom of speech are our attack is under attack. Peace and democracy are in danger. Switzerland continue to act in order to reinforce freedom of speech and freedom of journalists and medias uh, and the international and national level. In, in this frame of work, and in Switzerland, at the Security Council, we will lead tomorrow a debate, open debate, on the subject reinforce trust for uh, long-lasting peace. And I invite you all, uh, this long-lasting peace can be a concrete uh, thing only if we respect human rights. I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Obviously, one of the beautiful things about being at the UN is the variety of different languages that you hear. I love languages, Arabic, my native tongue, French. Uh, sorry I don't speak German, but it's a beautiful language too. And now we come, <laughs> now we come to a language that I really love also. And luckily for me, I'll have the help of Spanish translators. <laughs> And by the way, I think that translation is just as important as freedom of the press. Um, Minister Camilla, uh, Minister, thank you. <laughs> Minister Camilla uh, Vallejo, you have recently introduced a new law in your country, in Chile, to promote the safety of journalists. So I was wondering if you could tell us a few things about that law. Well, first of all, very good afternoon. Everyone that's gathered here, it's really an honor to be here sharing with you some aspects about this very important role, which is freedom of press and freedom of expression. I wanted to tell you, first of all, that among some of the commitments of our government of Chile, of President Boric is to guarantee the right to information, freedom of expression, freedom of press. And by the way, the media outlets should not be victims of interventionism, of uh, pressures uh, by the government that are um, in office. We establish the importance to promote a media ecosystem that's diverse, which should also be decentralized. We have a very um, vast country, so it's important to recognize through the media also the reality of each of the regions and the different territories that we have in Chile. Indeed, we have established a, a commitment in the area of the protection and safeguard of all the workers that work in the media, not only journalists, but anyone that works in the media industry. That. A commitment has materialized through a la draft legislation that we have sponsored from the government and that we have been working on with all the members of parliament and um, National Congress. It, it stems from the UNESCO framework uh, um, recommendation for protecting journalists. We've taken on the proposal from UNESCO and we wanted to adapt it to the reality and the legal framework um, in Chile. That was discussed in Parliament first, prior to the draft le legislations with the different uh, stakeholders of the civil society, uh, feminist networks, uh, journalist unions, also um, representatives from the media industry to see how we could adapt the UNESCO proposal to the context and the reality of Chile and its needs. 
So in that regard, and taking into account that while Chile is not in a critical situation regarding violence against journalists, but it, however, it has been increasing the violence against media workers. Uh, recently, a year ago, on May 1st, was the anniversary of the killing of a young journalist who was killed in the context of covering and reporting on a demonstration of workers on May 1st. Um, of course, that highlighted the importance of advancing on this legislation. So this draft law establishes a legal framework for the protection of media workers, as I said. Not, this is not just limited to journalists. We're talking about photojournalists, camera, uh, men and women, reporters, editors, anyone that who contribute to the mobilization of uh, that would be engaged and participate in media coverage, uh, also in demonstrations, but overall anyone who works in that field. Uh, it also establishes um, the importance of that legal good, which is legal, a freedom of press and freedom of information through the protection of these workers. And there's a duty by the state, it establishes the duty of the state in order to uh, fulfill this, to make sure that there will be no impunity and uh, whenever there are attacks, um, these perpetrators are brought to justice. So this is a draft legislation that uh, puts this uh, subject at the center of the debate in Chile when it comes to the material protection of uh, media workers. And this has been, uh, it's been debated upon at the uh, National Congress. There was a technical commission at the lower chamber uh, of the Congress in Chile, and we hope that soon, this year, we hope to enact this law and advance on this legal framework that will bring more certainty to those who day in, day out, every day bring news, they inform us, they want to maintain transparency in our country, in our country, and they ensure that information reaches our constituents. We hope that this will set an example and that we, we will also open the door to other discussions which are necessary in our country to guarantee the right to information and to fight misinformation and above all to strengthen our democracy our democracy thank you so much the three of you um, and i think now we're going to quickly uh, without much uh, further ado move on to the q a uh, session i don't know how much time we have uh, for the q a given the delay that we had starting uh, these uh, proceedings this afternoon but if you are a representative of a country and you'd like to make a statement, uh, uh, please um, go ahead and make the statement. If you're not a representative of a state, you have a, a question, please make the question very brief and directed. Thank you very much. I understand uh, to start with that the Greeks are very interested in making a statement. Yes, they are. Please go ahead. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, actually, it's not only the Greeks. The Greeks are very much interested, but it's also another 26 member states who we form all together the Group of Friends of the Protection of Journalists. So I have the honor to read out a, a brief statement which this Group of Friends have prepared on the occasion of that day, if you allow. Thank you very much. On the occasion of World Press Freedom Day, the Group of Friends for the Protection of Journalists stands firm in its unwavering dedication to the principles of a free, independent, and pluralistic press and to assuring the safety and protection of the journalists and media workers worldwide. We recognize that attacks against journalists and media workers not only harm the individuals targeted, but also have a chilling effect on freedom of expression and access to information. The international community is currently witnessing increasing threats to press freedom around the world, through deteriorating safety situation, repressive media trends, and shrinking space for civil society. 
The increase in disinformation and polarizing discourse threatens democracy and press freedom, as do fierce attacks on factual reporting, both online and offline, all of which contributes to the erosion of public trust in established political system and news outlets. Disinformation attempts to abuse the legal system to silence journalists and media workers, as well as intimidation, harassment, and violence against them, their families, and their employers, pose a growing threat to the enjoyment of human rights and fundamental freedom. Truth is threatened by disinformation and hate speech seeking to blur the lines between facts and fiction, between science and conspiracy. Women journalists bear a disproportionate burden of being exposed to hate speech and hate crimes, often experiencing online harassment and abuse, threats, and acts of physical and sexual violence simply for doing the job. Women journalists play a critical role in promoting freedom of expression and access to information. They provide unique perspectives and insights that are essential for inclusive and diverse media coverage. However, the attacks and abuse they face undermine their ability to carry out the work effectively and safely. The Group of Friends for the Protection of Journalists recognizes the unique challenges faced by women journalists and media workers. We are committed to promoting gender equality and empowering women in the media sector. We support efforts to strengthen legal and institutional frameworks to protect women journalists and media workers from all forms of violence, harassment, and discrimination. This year, the theme of World Press Freedom Day 2023 is shaping a future of rights, freedom of expression as a driver for all other human rights. A free and independent and pluralistic media is a cornerstone of democratic governments. A free press serves as a watchdog exposing abuses of power, corruption, and human rights violations. It plays an essential role in identifying and promoting accountability for human rights violations and abuses and holds those in position of authority to account. Journalists and media workers play a crucial role in the flow of information, opinions, and ideas that are indispensable to building inclusive and tolerant societies, fortifying intercultural dialogue, as well as understanding and cooperation. Their work helps to promote transparency, accountability, and the rule of law, and provides a vital check on abuses of power and human rights violation. The Group of Friends for the Protection of Journalists values the contribution of all journalists and media workers and the courage to risk their freedom and lives for independent reporting. We remain fully committed to supporting them their mission. Their work is essential in ensuring that citizens are informed and empowered, and that those in position of power are held accountable for their action. This year, as we celebrate not only the 13th anniversary of World Press Freedom Day, but also the 75th anniversary of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and the 13th anniversary of the Vienna Conference and its Declaration and Program of Action on Human Rights, the Group of Friends for the Protection of Journalists joins UNESCO in its call to recenter press freedom, as well as independent, pluralistic, and diverse media as key to the enjoyment of all other human rights. The Group of Friends for the Protection of Journalists remains more determined than ever to promote respect for human rights and fundamental freedoms of journalists and media workers, including through the implementation of the resolutions on the protection of journalists, as well as the United Nations Action Plan of, uh, plan of Action on the Safety of Journalists. The member states of the Group of Friends remain firmly committed to promote and respect freedom of expression, media freedom and independence of the media. This group continues and will continue to work closely with all EU and UN entities, media representatives, academia, and NGOs in this issue. We reaffirm a strong support to the efforts of UNESCO and international and local organizations to promote the protection of journalists, their rights and freedom, and to all member states promoting a safe environment in which journalists can exercise their profession without fear of reprisals. This includes supporting initiatives to strengthen legal and regulatory framework to protect freedom of expression and access to information, as well as effort to enhance the safety of journalists and media workers. We recognize that promoting a safe environment for journalists required the active participation of all member states. We call on all member states to take concrete steps to promote freedom of expression and protect journalists and media workers from attacks and harassment. Today, as we also honor journalists imprisoned and killed in the line of duty, we take stack of press freedom as well as the safety and security of journalists around the world. This includes ensuring the perpetrators of attacks against journalists are held accountable for their actions. Thank you very much for giving us the opportunity, Mr. Chair.
Thank you so much. And as a journalist, I have to thank you 26 times, once for Greece and 25 times for the other voices that you included in your statement. Thank you very much. I think I've been told that we've come to the end uh, of uh, this part of uh, the event, but uh, I w would be amiss uh, to say goodbye without thanking again um, our esteemed uh, uh, panelists, Anna Lohmann uh, from uh, Germany, uh, Camila Vallejo from uh, Chile, and uh, Thomas Gerber from uh, uh, Switzerland. Thank you all very much. Abdul Rahim, reading my mind there on, on the timekeeping, thank you. Um, and thank you very much, ministers, for your continued commitment to supporting a safer environment for journalists and for media workers. Your words are very much appreciated. In recent years, we have seen increasing cross-border collaboration of investigative journalism in uncovering human rights abuses and holding the powerful to account. Journalists play a critical role in documenting potential attacks against other journalists. Our next panel is going to delve into the role of journalists in promoting human rights. And I want to welcome to the stage our distinguished guests for this session. Uh, Serhii Tomilenko, President of the National Union of Journalists in Ukraine. Rana Ayub, journalist and columnist for the Washington Post. Lillian Landor, Director of the BBC World Service, and Jose Zamora, Chief Communications and Impact Officer at Exile. And now I hand over to Ms. Hoda Osman, who is Executive Editor of the Arab Reporters for Investigative Journalism. Thank you, Michelle. It's a pleasure to moderate this important discussion. The crucial role of investigative journalists in uncovering human rights abuses throughout history cannot be overstated. It is through their work that the public becomes aware of such atrocious acts and there's a chance, a possibility for accountability. Such work often poses significant risks to the journalists themselves. There are alarming trends of journalists being displaced because of conflicts and wars and also of political persecution. So we will talk about this with the panelists in this session. And Serhi, I'd like to start with you, and I want to thank you for being here today. I can only imagine it's not easy to come and make this trip with the war going on in Ukraine. From David Roth, who was a speaker at the panel earlier today, exposing the massacres in Srebrenica in 1995, to Azmat Khan, whose Pulitzer Prize-winning investigation documented the civilian deaths in the Afghanistan and Iraq wars. Investigative journalists have continuously played a pivotal role in documenting abuses and deaths during wars. So, as the president of the National Union of Journalists of Ukraine, can you tell me about some of the work that the journalists are doing uh, over there right now, and also your insights about the importance of investigative journalism during a war? Okay, thank you. Dear colleagues, uh, I'm, I'm Serhii from Kyiv, and it's a great honor to me to be here and to share with you my opinions about how journalists and media are defending human rights during, during this unjust war in which Russia is killing civilians every day. Before traveling to New York uh, for this panel, I asked my colleagues uh, well-known investigators uh, and uh, editors of uh, small local frontline newspapers, uh, civil rights act acti activists uh, such as uh, Nobel Peace Prize winner Alexander Matvichuk to, <coughs> to give me advice on what is important to voice here. And children, the first I would like to talk about kidnapping. Russians kidnap Ukrainian children, isolate them from their families, and try to rewrite their future. And forced dep deportation of children from temporarily occupied territories of Kherson, Mariupol, of the Kharkiv region, intimidation of children, and attempts to re-educate them in special camps. Journalists reconstruct these war crimes in detail often becoming the only hope for parents to return their children to their families. 
and it was uh, verified investigations into the forced deportation of Ukrainian children that contributed to the issuance of an international criminal court's arrest warrant for Putin and his henchmen. During the war, rights of thousands and thousands of people are violated on a large scale. So journalists and the media increase the chances of each individual victim for their story to be heard. Documenting war crimes by journalists helps establish the truth and brings the, qual the guilty to justice. And for example, today, a small local frontline newspaper, Obri Izumshine, is the main source of information for police and prosecutor investigators into the crimes of local collaborators during the Russia occupation of the city of Izum. So the role of journalists in covering war crimes trials is also important. And because journalists and mass media fix war crimes, the Russian army considers Ukrainian journalists and all foreign journalists too as it targets. And there are numerous testimonies about targeted attacks on cars marked with the inscription press, deliberate killings of journalists who walked on the front line, attacks on publishing houses, arrests, kidnappings, torture. And uh, at the last, I want to tell the story of Svetlana Zelizetska, the editor-in-chief and my colleague from small city Militopol. She is editor-in-chief Ria Militopol, and when Russians occupied Militopol, they searched her house and arrested her elderly 75-year father, and then they called her and demanded that they, and proposed that they can change daughter journalists for her father. It's shameless, and, but it's uh, the example how Ukrainian journalists are brave. Thank you, Serhi. Rana, I want to turn to you. You're a prominent journalist. You've done such investigative work yourself in your book, The Gujarat Files, about the events surrounding the 2002 uh, riots. You described investigative journalism as a public service. You also write the truth is never easy to find, but it, it is always worth seeking. So can you talk to us about your work and your insistence on continuing to do investigative work in spite of the obvious dangers? Good evening, everybody. Um, this is my first time at the UN General Assembly, and I want to add, before I speak anything else, I have normally seen world leaders talk about democratic values right here at this podium. And some of us journalists watching, watching it on TV, you look at them and are like, hey, you're anything but democratic. So this morning, uh, we began our keynote speech with Mr. Salzberg of the New York Times talking about uh, the Indian state treating its journalists as terrorists, especially with the raids on various media houses. So in that situation, as a journalist who herself is a critic of the government, who is a woman and a Muslim, um, I think it has never been a more difficult time to be a journalist who is talking about the oppressed, the marginalized, the persecuted in India. Um, back in 2010, I went undercover with eight cameras on my body to... Um, an undercover operation posing as a Hindu nationalist um, to talk about the role of Hindu nationalists, uh, Mr. Modi's government, who was then the chief minister in the, in the 2002 Gujarat genocide. And ever since, my life has not been the same. Um, I have multiple charges against me. Somebody, um, you know, Ms. Ms. Power was speaking about legal warfare. So I have money laundering, tax evasion, defamation, a recent criminal defamation against me for an article I wrote 15 years ago. And the accusation against me is that accused number two is a practicing Muslim, hence prejudiced. Uh, yeah, that's an accusation against me. But that is something that we journalists in democracies, world's largest democracies. I come from India, the land of democracy, which prides itself on about its democratic values. I love my country more than I love any other entity in the world, but it, which is why it is more important for me, especially when, you know, when we talk about attacks on the press, we normally never look at India as much because India is seen as this 
a place of democracy, you know, syncretic values and culture and pluralism. But what the world does not see is that for the first time in its history, there is a sustained attack on the 200 million Muslim minorities on the lower caste in India systematically, even as the country gears up to hold the G20 summit in India, where world leaders are coming to India and talking about the virtues of democracy. So which is precisely the reason why many journalists like us who are being persecuted in our home country need to speak loud and clear because the world does not wish to hear certain stories. The world does not wish to hear unpopular stories, which is why we must speak loud and clear. Uh, you asked me how do we do the sustained thing? Well, we don't have a choice. Do we, have a re do we really have a choice? We are not given a choice to say, you either do this or you do that. The only choice is probably we speak truth to power, which is why I did the undercover operation, which is why I went undercover. I did my investigative journalism, which is why I continue to do speak for the marginalized, and which is why it is important for the world to shift its attention to India. Because we do not really talk about India as much, and I really hope we do that uh, in the days to come. Thank you, Rana. Liliana, I'd like to turn to you. Rana and Serhi both talked about their countries, Ukraine and India. As the director of the BBC World Service, you have extensive experience covering, uh, doing investigative work, uncovering human rights abuses all over the world. So I'd like you to give us this broad perspective to talk about some of the challenges and also maybe touch on the issue of accountability. Good, thank you. Thanks for having me here. And I too want to talk about democracy. I too want to be able to say that investigative journalism has a huge role to play in keeping democracy as it becomes more and more fragile and more and more contested and human rights so volatile. So thanks for introducing this. From my perspective as director of the World Service, I believe that journalism cannot be but global, both in its point of departure and in its outlook. And whatever the subject matter, journalism has to transcend national boundaries. And it is this journalism, this investigative journalism that is searching, that is courageous, that is questioning, that holds power to account, that is dangerous for those doing the searching and the uncovering. This journalism that we encourage and that we will make an impact and will trigger change. So one number for you in their latest Press Freedom Index, uh, Reporters Sans Frontières, Reporters Without Borders, showed that journalism is completely or partly blocked in 73% of the 180 countries that they surveyed. And hundreds of journalisms going from Afghanistan to Turkey, going through Egypt and the Philippines and the Middle East, etc. Hundreds of them are being detained, are being beaten up, are being charged with crimes, and in some cases, as we know, gunned down and tortured. To silence them and to erase their journalism. We have, in the BBC, investigated the human rights violations of the Uyghurs in China, and we got chucked out of China. We have covered Russia's invasion of Ukraine in Russian, and we got forced out of Russia. Our coverage of Belarus put our reporters at risk, and the accreditation has been taken away from them. We can no longer work in Iran. All our Iranian journalists work from London are day in, day out, submitted to the worst type of cyber threats and harassment. And our output in Myanmar, in Burma, someone was talking about Burma earlier, is completely blocked. From time to time, it re-emerges and then it's blocked again. Um, and the latest example is Sudan, where we reported firsthand. We had one journalist for the whole of the BBC, uh, for the BBC Arabic. Uh, he was arrested, his car was stolen, he was shot at, he had to leave. But we do not cower from difficult stories, and we do listen to the voices that otherwise would be completely overlooked. And so the, the, what we worked on were issues that range from um, the treatment of homosexuals in Egypt to uh, the Wagner Group, uh, Russia's mercenaries, what are they doing in Libya, questions that we asked, 
to sexual abuse on tea plantations in Kenya. And latterly, we investigated the torture of young Russian women, anti-war protesters, and exposed the identity of their torturers. All of this comes at a cost. I know people before me, and from this morning onwards, have been talking about the cost that journalists bear. This is harassment, this is intimidation, this is imprisonment, this is threats to them and their family. And how do you withstand all of this? And I look at you, how do you withstand the political pressure? How do you withstand the economic pressure? pressure. Now, I uh, sit in, a, in quite a privileged position where we uh, can send some of our Western journalists in country to do various stories and work with our local journalists. The issue is that these Western journalists can come out whenever they want to. It is the local journalist to whom these rules don't apply. They're under fire and they're subjected to some laws, defamation laws, libel laws that have been devised in order to control their journalism. So th this is the challenge. I can go on and on, but you're looking at me and I know we're running out of time. Yeah. No, I'm looking at you because I'm like, you know, this list that you just listed is just incredible. It just shows this is a topic of our session. No. You know, this is the work that exposes Absolutely. such abuses, and yeah. without it, what do we do? Yeah. And there seems to be an attack and costs, and Jose, actually, you can speak about the cost. You've, you're experiencing the cost yourself as a family, because you're the communications, the chief communications officer of Exile Content Studio, but also you're the voice of your father, Jose Ruben Zamora, who's been in prison for eight months now. He's an in, in, in investigative journalist in Guatemala. I understand that the final stage of hearings started today, and you are expecting a verdict in the coming weeks. So I want to thank you. I know that this is a difficult time for you and your family, so I thank you for being here today, and I, I'd like you to speak to us about the work of your father and also to update us on the case. Thank you, Hoda, and thank you, everyone. It's uh, surreal to be here today because uh, Today, my father has been in prison, in preventive prison for 277 days. Uh, uh, an imprisonment that it has been illegal and irregular. Uh, I say the, the government has him uh, illegally detained. And, and I'll repeat this in Spanish because I think it's very important that the regime of Alejandro Yamatei listens to this. Mi papá es My father has been kidnapped by the state of Guatemala. It is time for him, for them to let him go. For 277 days, and today, while we're sitting here, he is starting the final hearing of his trial on spurious charges of money laundering. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's interesting to see uh, his real crime has been doing journalism. During the first 144 weeks of, of uh, the President Yamate's administration, my father in the newspaper where, where he works it published 144 investigations into corruption of the Yamate administration. Uh, the two uh, final stories that uh, led to his arrest uh, where uh, one about uh, how the, the government uh, bought uh, <coughs> under a very irregular contract vaccines from Russia, and the second how uh, the Guatemalan government uh, gave um, a contract to a Russian mining company under a very onerous contract for Guatemala. Um, that, that investigation was the breaking point that led to this. It's interesting because we were uh, talking in the back about how these uh, tactics from these repressive regimes have evolved over the years, and uh, they have built something that I call the, the repressive regime handbook. So originally, they always focused on defamating journalists because they know journalists only asset is their credibility. So they were always attacking their credibility. And from the other side, they, there were death threats and assassination attempts and assassinations. But with time, they realized that 
killing journalists came at a very high cost. So what they discovered was a very simple and, and useful tactic was to use the law to persecute them. So they started with using civil law and, and, and slaps. And in the case of my father in El Periodico, at some point he had 140 lawsuits, some using a law of femicide uh, that is, was established to protect women in vulnerable positions. Uh, uh, and they, Congresswomen started using it to, to, to sue the newspaper and sue him. And then, most recently, they started using criminal law because they discovered that when you have co-opted the entire system and you work under a democratic facade, you can use criminal charges to very easily uh, put journalists in prison. And by putting journalists in prison, you attack their credibility, uh, you attack uh, their finances, and you send a message to all journalists in the country that doing journalism is a crime. And I think that was what the Yamatei administration had in mind when they put him in jail. They had three objectives. One was punish him personally. He's a pain because he investigates and denounces, denounces corruption. Second, they wanted to shut down the newspaper, El Periódico. And third, they wanted to send a clear message to all journalists in the country that if you denounce corruption, we'll come after you and we'll imprison you. Thank you, Jose. As you're saying this, I see all of us here nodding, you know, about how the law is being used against uh, journalists in so many countries. It's, it's like it's become a universal handbook that is being used over and over again. Serhi, I'd like to uh, turn back to you. We've talked about this a little bit already, but with regards to journalist safety, you and your colleagues <coughs> have supported journalists across the Ukraine through these uh, solidarity centers. Can you talk to us about the risks that the journalists are facing right now and also tell me about some of the initiatives that have emerged with regards to journalist safety over the past 15 months? Yep. Okay, many thanks uh, about questions about solidarity, but uh, I want to start with, um, with some data or with some facts uh, that uh, since the beginning of the big war, Russians have killed at least 57 media workers in Ukraine. It's uh, as professional journalists, it's as civilian uh, victims, and uh, as mobilized soldiers, but uh, with background, media background. And uh, the last victim is Bogdan Bitik, the Ukrainian fixer of Italian La Repubblica, who was killed by Russians last week in Kherson when he try to, to cover the uh, situation in Ukraine. And at least one civilian Ukrainian journalist who was captured last year in March is still behind bars in Russia. Uh, this is Dmitro Hiluk, a journalist of the national news agency Union from Kyiv. And we demand Russia release Dmitro Hiluk, release all illegally convicted Crimean Tatar civic journalists and Vladislav Yesepenka and Irina Danilovich convicted in Crimea. And these days, on the example of Evan Gershkovich, we can see that totalitarian Russia is ready to apply its well-known repressive practices to every independent journalist. And it's our reality. But indeed, we, um, we from f uh, the first day of full-scale invasion, we, receiving, we were receiving hundreds and hundreds of requests from journalists who wanted to survive, who evacuated, who was injured, and uh, we created special our network, Journalist Solidarity Centers, uh, thanks to international and European federations of journalists, thanks to UNESCO headquarters. And now um, our network uh, consisted of six uh, uh, centers. The main is in Kyiv, uh, in our office, but uh, three on Western Ukraine as more safety places. 
place in Ukraine and two front line in Dnipro and Zaporizhia. It's some network with small staff, with uh, as, uh, some hub, with laptops, with communication, with generators, but it's uh, some, some points, uh, some places to receive uh, support in which need our Ukrainians and foreign journalists uh, want. And our priority is safety, and uh, we collected, uh, and at first day of full-scale invasion, we had only four sets of safety equipments, only four, and three of them were located in Mariupol. But now we collected 300 sets of safety equipments, 125 from UNESCO, it's high level um, safety equipments, and we organize our rental points uh, for foreign journalists, for Ukrainian journalists, and every journalist who now are going to front line, they can free rent this safety equipment, and we try to support with war accreditation, with safety issues too. And I want to present our the main, my, maybe a new priority, it's uh, mm, we as union, we try to support our colleagues, uh, editors of uh, small uh, local newspapers from frontline and deoccupied territories. Because Russians, they ruins infrastructure, they ruins our houses, and uh, Ukrainians or local residents, they can't consume TV news, radio news, they can't consume digital news because there are no electricity, no, and only print media is only media which can be consumed if uh, our Ukrainians receive such newspapers. So I want to present one uh, of the 25 such uh, frontline newspapers which we try to support. It's very unique. Uh, it's newspaper for Bakhmut, and <coughs> it was printed, its last issue was printed at 12 of April. It's not military newspaper, it's just, uh, just ordinary local newspaper, but it, uh, the editor-in-chief evacuated or in a refugee in Odessa, she collected this information in news, she uh, um, printed it, uh, this uh, newspaper in Kiev, and then it delivered by army, by volunteer to Bakhmut, to local residents. Because as uh, yesterday, um, uh, was a screening of 20 days in Mariupol, and our brave journalist, uh, filmmaker, Sislav Chernov, who created uh, this uh, documentary, he testimonied that in Mariupol, uh, people, the importance of news was bigger than food for people. Thank you, thank you, Serhi. Rana, I want to turn to you because women journalists face particular threats. You yourself have been a target. Your colleague and friend, Gauri Lankesh, was killed in 2017. Online threats have also become a big part of this. One report that's been mentioned several times today is the UNESCO Commission, the report that was conducted by the International Center for Journalists, which, which showed that 73% of those surveyed, of women journalists who were surveyed, said that they've experienced online violence, and 20% of those said that this online violence, this abuse also spilled offline. So can you talk about this and also share your personal experience? Absolutely, Hoda. I think um, the ICFJ study along with UNESCO said that I am attacked every 19 seconds on the internet. Right? That's, I mean, every 19 seconds there's a death threat, a rape threat, and that Jose was pointing out, there's a playbook that all dictators adopt. One is to discredit you online, you know. Uh, and second, earlier they used to file, you know, defamation cases, war against nation, then they realized those charges don't stick. So let's do tax evasion, money laundering, corruption, right? You know, those charges, if you see, it's a pattern globally because these charges kind of, you know, you, you point a seed of suspicion in people's mind. You, you spoke about Gauri Lankesh. Gauri Lankesh was an Indian journalist who was 
routinely writing about Hindu nationalist. In the year 2017, she translated my book in a regional language in Kannada. And a day before her assassination, you know, um, I was facing uh, online harassment significantly. I was trending on Twitter and she called me and she messaged me saying, babe, babe they are paper tigers, they are income poops, don't even bother, right? And look forward to our book launch. And the next day, I'm sitting at a coffee shop and I hear that Gauri Lankesh has been shot dead outside her house. Gauri had been ignoring these threats which were coming to her routinely, thinking that these people, you know, online does not spill over offline. I go and file complaints routinely to the Mumbai police the city where I live, and these guys, the cops look at me and say, but ma'am, it was online, right? It's not come to your house. Yeah, burnt copies of my book have been sent to my house. I received death threats. I, I have a guy who sends me a message saying, I saw you outside your apartment, names my building and says, I'm going to gang rape you, your sister, your mother, describes various positions. And a lot of people who give these death threats on Twitter, guess what does the Twitter bio read, followed by the Prime Minister of India? That's how brazen it is. These Hindu nationalists who masquerade as nationalists, right? I mean, today I sp spoke about, I tweeted about speaking here. And one of them said, dare you speak about India and then we will show what it takes, right? So people who believe that, you know, Online harassment is actually a very frivolous thing. Honestly, you have to wake up and realize that there is a campaign out there to smear journalists. Online harassment is about, for instance, last year when the government filed money laundering charges against me, I was trending for three full days on Twitter. Con, fraud, thief, media outside my house, uh, cameras placed on my six-year-old nephew saying, where is Rana Ayub? Somebody placed a camera opposite my building to get the first view of my living room. That's, that's the reality that we face when they're not... When they're not accusing us of corruption or war against nation, they morph your image on a porn video and circulate it all over the country. My image was morphed on a porn video and circulated over the country, and one of the video was shared by a leader of the ruling party. That's what they do. They discredit you. They discredit your character. They discredit your integrity. They discredit everything so that by the time you're arrested, or for that matter, even shot dead, the world doesn't really care much. And that's, the, that's, that's what Jose has been saying. That was, you know, Lilian said, spoke about, you know, investigative journalism. We saw a BBC documentary in India that was released. And um, Indian government reached out to Twitter asking for the BBC documentary links to be removed from Twitter and banned the documentary on, in India. We are the world's largest democracy, but the Prime Minister of India has not taken a single press conference in the last eight years. Uh, very often, journalists are referred to uh, by members of the ruling party and ministers as prostitutes, news traders. Um, I don't know what my fate looks like. I have a court hearing in the morning when people ask me, so what are you doing next week? I'm like, I'm at the mercy of courts. I have no idea which court will pass an order at what point of time. I really do not know. Um, you know, at this point of time, clearing the immigration at the airport is the biggest victory of my life. Every time I'm in the immigration queue, I'm like, will I clear immigration this time or not? Because last year, I was stopped two times at the airport when I was going to speak at an event on democracy. That's what democracy looks like. That's what threats on journalists look like. And we do not even talk about the mental health aspect of it, right? After we have fought all these cases, when we get back home, do you even have the energy to do your journalism? You know, you exhaust you with those multiple cases and by the time you come back home, all you want to do is, unfortunately, in my case, pop a sleeping pill and go to sleep. I mean, I just popped an anxiety pill before coming to uh, speak here because I get triggered very often. I get triggered when I hear about journalists being jailed because uh, three weeks ago in India, a lawmaker was shot dead live on camera and I, we had people celebrating that on Twitter, right? Um, when there is absolute lawlessness, when there is so much brazenness in a country that, that, that calls itself a democracy, I take great pride in being a part of a journalist who was a part of the world's largest democracy, but the way it is sliding into, the way it's, it's sliding into this absolute, absolute fascist tendency, which, which Jose, again, I keep coming to you because I see parallels in all our cases. They learn from each other. And we are speaking here, we don't know what our fate looks like tomorrow morning, whether we'll be alive or not, whether when Gauri Lankesh spoke to me, you know, after all those threats, she said, babe, there are paper tigers, I don't know what will my fate be tomorrow morning, I don't know what will I go to India to. Um, so that's the life that we are living, unfortunately, we are the enemies of the state, none of us really need to be brave or courageous to be doing our journalism, you know, oftentimes we are being called, oh, you're brave and you're courageous, I hate hearing that word. Completely. I feel like the moment you call us brave and courageous, you put us on a pedestal, assuming that we're going to be, we're not allowed to be human. We're not allowed to be vulnerable. And I really hope the world also understands that people who you put on pedestal, these heroes that you make of us, we are also human beings, and we get affected tremendously by this. And our families get affected tremendously by this. Thank you, Rana.
Jose, um, you are the uh, chief communications officer of Exile Content Studio, which you describe as a place that creates content and features the voices of diverse Spanish-speaking communities from around the world. Some of the work that you do is uh, related to journalism projects. A lot of uh, journalists have been forced out of their countries, are in exile, and are producing media content uh, from there. So I want you to speak. I'm sorry, I'm mindful of the time, so I'm going to ask you to be brief and rush you a little bit through the uh, next few questions. But to speak briefly about the uh, content being produced by diaspora journalists and the difficulties of doing that, and also whether or not they're still able to contribute towards exposing human rights abuses in their countries of origin. Well. Uh, it's, a, it's a trend, unfortunately. Uh, more and more countries are being repressive against their democratic institutions, like the case of Guatemala, or you see Venezuela, Nicaragua, El Salvador. And uh, journalists have been forced to move out of their country to continue <coughs> reporting. Uh, this has been challenging. Uh, you, you lose contact to your local sources, and, and, but with time, you manage to find ways to do it. And I think uh, it's really important to maintain the eyes of the world in those countries facing these repressive regimes. Um, for example, in El Salvador had to move uh, El Faro, it had to move their, their, their organization to Costa Rica. The same thing happened uh, with journalists in Nicaragua. So you are seeing that more and more, which is very unfortunate. But uh, what is important is that they continue to do their job and they continue to do it well. Uh, one trend that I have also seen is how the journalists that remain uh, have become more uh, collaborative than ever. Uh, so I, I think that's uh, very important and it's, it gives you a lot of hope. But what I also think it's very important is to ensure that all news organizations, especially international organizations, keep their eyes on our countries and on these repressive regimes and keep telling everyone what's going on. Thank you, Jose. Uh, we've been talking about investigative journalism during wars and conflicts, but one uh, right that is also increasingly endangered is the right to live in a healthy environment. In 2022, the UN General Assembly passed a resolution recognizing this as a right. And journalists who cover the climate crisis and the uh, environment have, be been, have uh, be, uh, come under increasing attacks. So Liliana, I want to ask you about this, about like investigative journalism when it comes to covering the climate and what you're seeing from your perspective. Very happy to, to answer. But before I do so, I'm going to take one minute to say that listening to Jose and listening to, Ra to Rana, my suggestion for UNESCO next year is that they have a panel that concentrates specifically on harassment of journalists and invite the tech platforms. Invite Twitter, invite Facebook, invite Microsoft, invite YouTube, and then let's take part of account and let's discuss where we are. I think that's quite important because there have been so many declarations of support and they're all received, I'm sure, very, very generously. But at the same time, there needs to be something practical that is done. And when you hear that someone has been killed just for the sin of translating a book, you think there needs to be boundaries somewhere. And if not the UN, who is going to impose them? So I'm hoping that someone is listening to me from the fantastic organizing committee and takes that suggestion on board. I'm going to take a talk very quickly. I can see that we only have three minutes. I'm going to take two of these minutes to talk about climate change and journalism about climate change. So the media shapes uh, the public discourse on climate change and this shaping power places quite a big responsibility uh, on us journalists. Now, uh, the, the discourse around climate change can be terribly doom and gloom, uh, could be very dry at times and could be quite depressing. And so there is a way of going around this by flipping it around and saying there should be nothing called climate change journalism. 
Economics journalism is climate change journalism. Health journalism is climate change journalism. Politics is climate change journalism. So where does that leave us? Uh, I'm going to give you a very quick example of something that we did at the World Service, uh, the BBC, which is a season on climate change, which we called Life at 50. Now, it's not life at 50, i.e. I am 50, well, I'm older than 50, life at 50, it's about life at 50 degrees. How do people cope when they have to sit and live on the front line of climate change? And we went from Mauritania to Nigeria to Canada, interestingly, where a town called Lytton, I think, practically fried because it got so hot there. So we, we, we covered all this devastating impact, but the one story that stuck with me was um, migrant workers, mostly from South Asia, working in Qatar and dying of extreme life-changing illnesses and heart attacks, etc. all of it triggered by the heat. That was the story. The other part of the story was, of course, that Qatar was underreporting those deaths. So we hit two birds with one stone. Um, I want to talk about one thing that some of you may not agree with me on climate change. And this is the fact that sometimes sticking a climate change label onto a story could be too convenient. Uh, I want to quote uh, the, a man called David Pilling, who works for the Financial Times, who is the Africa editor of the Financial Times, and he wrote a very challenging article about Madagascar, where a third of the population is basically in a humanitarian emergency crisis, as they call it. It's a famine, and the UN decreed that this was the world's first climate change famine. Well, various scientists beg to disagree with this. They beg to disagree with this because they said that this famine was not just driven by climate. This famine was driven by poverty, by policy decisions, by infrastructure, by mistakes that have been uh, made by the authorities, and by years of neglect and corruption. And this is very important because sometimes sticking the label climate change can somehow exonerate governments and authorities. And I think that we have to be always aware of how many hands are on this axe, how many responsibilities are there over and above just climate change. So that's my two pennies worth, as I say in English. Thank you very much. Thank you, Lilian. We're out of time, but I want to do a very quick 30-second round on like uh, conclusive remarks related to maybe looking ahead investigative journalism and human rights abuses. We have more tools, more digital tools, more technology than ever that help us with these investigations, but at the same time, there's a troubling pattern of impunity and lack of accountability. So what would you say in like, you know, a sentence or two? Let's start with you, Lilian. I would say that the tools exist and we should not uh, neglect them. I think the fact that we are connected, the fact that now we can work cooperatively, the, and the Panama Papers are such a fantastic example of journalists the world over getting together, that should not take away from, of course, cyber harassment and what is happening online as well. So it's two sides of the same coin and it's quite important for us to be uh, completely aware. Of. Thank you, Lilian Jose. Uh, I think we have more and more of, of these repressive regimes all around the world, and they have these uh, tactics and handbooks that they copy from each other. I think it is time for us to create, create our own handbook and be prepared to defend ourselves and, and, and have the, the tools and the network to, to activate immediately when these attacks start to happen. Yeah, I mean, all we have right now is each other. We have to extend solidarity to each other without, and the, and the solidarity should not be convenient. It should not be pick and choose solidarity that, okay, you have to, you have to express solidarity from, uh, with journalists from this country because it's convenient. I think we need to extend solidarity with journalists in Russia, 
and also in Palestine and also in Kashmir. The solidarity has to be equal, inclusive, and that's the only way for us to go forward because solidarity cannot pick and choose sides. And that's what I think that's the only way forward for us. Thank you, Rana. And Sirhi, very quickly, in less than 30 seconds. Okay. We, are, we are talking about the role of brave journalists during the war, but we should talk about responsibility of propagandists and we should protect journalism status from propagandists and uh, uh, we as union, we support a special tribunal on propaganda, propaganda for inside this war and we uh, such should uh, protect our profession too. Thank you so much. I would like to thank you all very much and apologize that we're not going to be able to take questions because of the earlier d delay. We don't have time for that, but I would like to thank the panelists for this incredible discussion. Thank you. Freedom Day, the idea of UNESCO, highlights the need for greater freedom. In adopting this Windhoek Declaration 30 years ago, the international community affirmed that information was a public good at a time when, as we've seen, it was far from being assured. I think it was David Rhodes said earlier today that it is the personal stories that it's about talking to people and I think that panel just now illustrated when you hear those personal stories it is a reminder of sort of how important it resonates in a way the importance of press freedoms and human rights. Now our next panel joint declaration from special mandate holders on media freedom and democracy shines a light not on institutions and international organizations like the ones we heard from earlier today, but on regional bodies and special mandates on press freedom and freedom of expression. So please join me in welcoming to the stage Irene Khan, UN Special Rapporteur on Freedom of Expression. Ovina Garisha Topsisunu, African Union Special Rapporteur on Freedom of Expression and Access to Information. Pedro. Vaca Villarreal, Special Rapporteur of the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights, and Teresa Ribeiro, OSCE Representative on Freedom of the Media. And now, and with that, I hand over to Barbara Bukowska, Senior Director for Law and Policy at Article 19. Hello, everyone. As uh, our Master of Ceremony said, I'm Barbara Bukowska. I'm a Senior Director for Law and Policy at Article 19, which is an international freedom of expression organization. And it's a great pleasure to welcome you all at this session today where four free speech mandate holders, four freedom of expression and information rapporteur from different region, regional and global human rights systems are gonna launch their 2023 joint declaration. As some of you might know, uh, special rapporteurs have been annually preparing joint declaration, which is a document in which they speak in one voice about an issue which they consider extremely important for our community. And over the years, this joint declaration became a very important source of soft law because they codify certain issue which is presented in them. So I would like to welcome four special rapporteurs here. On my right, Irene, oh, sorry, on my left, Irene Khan, who is a UN special rapporteur on freedom of expression and opinion. Next to, uh, to her, Mrs. Girisha Topsi Sonu, the special rapporteur on freedom of expression and information from African Commission. On my right, Teresa Ribeiro, representative on freedom of the media, from the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe, and next to her, Pedro Vaca, 
the Special Rapporteur on Freedom of Expression from Inter-American Commission. The topic of this year joint declaration, which we have, Denise over there has a copy of it, but it's also available online, is the media freedom and democracy. It's a very important topic for Article 19, because we have been working on promoting freedom of expression and media freedom over the years, and also helping journalists and others, other communicators in this space. But it's also important for me personally, because I grew up under communist dictatorship where media were not free. And actually, I was told not to trust the media. And when I saw something in media, I immediately questioned it. And I remember after the fall of communism, I really had a genuine shock of my life when somebody mentioned the trust in the media because I couldn't understand why would anybody want to do it. And it took years to build this media freedom ecosystem in our region. And it was very heartening to hear in the beginning um, from Agnès Calamar who said that we are actually declining in democratic institutions to the times before 1989. So, I want to start with debating this uh, joint declaration and just uh, to let you know this is only a very short run through the document and there will be more uh, detailed discussion tomorrow morning and I will tell you where because of a lack of time. But I want to start with Irene and ask her because the topic which the joint declaration addresses, it's not new. All the special rapporteurs have addressed media freedom in their reports and in their work. So maybe you just tell us what are the concerns you wanted to address specifically this year and why you chose this topic. Um, this is the 30th anniversary. Uh, for 30 years, we have celebrated media freedom on this day. But here today, I think we are at the cusp of, uh, I have only one word for it, a crisis. We've heard since this morning, one after the other, the speakers talk about the situation of media freedom. Uh, next year, uh, we will witness 24 elections around the world, including in the world's largest democracies, like the United States, India, Indonesia, and I could go on and on with that. And that puts pressure on media. Media play an extremely important role in promoting, advancing, feeding, uh, uh, democracy. And our joint declaration is about media freedom and democracy. And what is that state of democracy? We actually see trends, authoritarian trends emerging around the world tightening. Authoritarian states are tightening their rule over their country and their grip over their own countries and their influence globally. We see, and very dangerously so, backsliding of democracies. We have just heard uh, uh, a citizen of the world's largest, most populous state, the largest democracy, talk about her problems. And then, of course, we have something else happening, digital technology. We've all been reading with great interest about uh, generative artificial intelligence, which might uh, give a different meaning to what it is to be human. And that digital technology, of course, is changing the way in which we produce, um, use, uh, consume uh, news, or disseminate news and information. So there are these huge global changes taking place. And those changes, and, and underpinning those changes, is this decline in public trust, a term that we use again and again and again. But what is actually then happening? We see killings of journalists, 86 in the last year. 86% of these of cases of killings are never resolved, not investigated, not prosecuted. We see law becoming a weapon, not a means of protecting journalists, but a weapon to persecute and harass them. Uh, slaps, we all know what that means, so I want to uh, go into uh, the acronym. Uh, we see criminalization of journalism again and again and again, and uh, we see laws that have nothing to do with journalism, such as taxation laws, financial uh, management, uh, scrutiny uh, laws, being used against journalists. And then we see an environment which is not conducive to media freedom. Uh, we see financial issues coming up, 
financial viability of even large, well-known stable outlets are now in question. Uh, media ownership. We talk, we realize the state control media capture that is taking place in many authoritarian states like the one in which you grew up, Barbara. However, we also see now media barons coming up. Uh, in large open societies, media is actually controlled by very few, very powerful, unaccountable people. And we have not heard enough of that today. I'm sorry to say we've heard about lots of problems in developing countries. We haven't heard the kinds of problems that are emerging in developed democratic states with the media. And those are the reasons why we believe that here and now we, as the four uh, multilateral experts on media freedom, on freedom of expression, ought to put the light on that issue and also come up with some solutions, some proposals uh, that would lead governments, we hope, governments and companies to reaffirm their commitment to media freedom. And we will discuss some of the solution in a minute, but now I want to turn to Teresa to actually tell us what is, I mean, we obviously like talk about this issue all the time, but what is really the role of the media in democracy, especially in the context of what I alluded to at the beginning when sometimes media are controlled either by states or the private actors, and why do you want to put forward these recommendations? Thank you, thank you very much uh, for your question, but also thank you very much uh, UNESCO for inviting us and to give us the opportunity to present and launch uh, this uh, joint declaration, which I think is quite a landmark and in a very important year because we are celebrating the uh, 70, 75, uh, uh, 75th anniversary of the Universal Declaration on Human Rights and precisely uh, the motto of uh, this year uh, celebration of the, of the Universal Declaration is precisely um, freedom of expression as an enabler of the enjoyment of uh, uh, whole human rights. So uh, this is very clear and this is the reason why it's so important and so central uh, to be here today and to have the possibility to present uh, our JD. Why is important to highlight uh, this, uh, this link between democracy uh, and, uh, and, uh, and media freedom. We know that, uh, first of all, uh, media freedom is central uh, to provide the needed information uh, that is uh, essential uh, to support the public debate uh, in our democratic societies. We don't have uh, this kind of uh, reliable, very reliable and pluralistic information, uh, of course, uh, the, the, the democratic uh, debate in, in our societies will be weakened, uh, and uh, if not, um, and, and in many cases, uh, it will not, uh, um, it will not uh, happen. So the first, uh, it's because it's essential uh, to ensure that we have reliable information um, to animate uh, the public debate. The second one, of course, the second reason why this is so important, um, the freedom, media freedom to democracy, uh, is that uh, it's, uh, it's the only way to uh, hold um, powerful uh, to account. And of course, we all know how important this role uh, of scrutiny is uh, for uh, our democratic societies and to protect uh, to protect the institutions and also to protect the trust of, uh, of citizens in uh, democratic uh, institutions. And, uh, and so uh, I think, uh, and we always have to be uh, very, uh, very aware that when uh, uh, all the, the declining or the backsliding uh, on democracy is immediately reflected on uh, media freedom. And this is very, very clear. So we need media freedom uh, to really ensure that uh, we have democracy and when we have signals uh, in that democracy is declining, it's uh, very clear 
uh, that also uh, media freedom is uh, declining. So um, all these reasons, of course, were clearly uh, showing us uh, how important it uh, was to um, put in a JD, which is a quite uh, important uh, uh, instrument of soft law, that it's much more used than we think mm. uh, in the courts uh, as recommendations, etc. How important it was to, uh, uh, to really codify uh, this, uh, uh, this, this topic, how important it was also uh, to identify all, um, all the, the different ingredients, all the different uh, uh, contributions that different stakeholders uh, should take into account if they want to contribute to a healthy uh, information ecosystem. So, it's, uh, of course, we have an important role for the states. They have the positive obligation uh, to protect uh, media freedom. Uh, but we also have an important, uh, we have also important recommendations for the platforms that are having a central role uh, in our information ecosystem and uh, also uh, to the media that uh, are uh, the, the, main, uh, the main actors, the main players uh, in this, uh, uh, in this uh, context. So, uh, at the same time, and let me, we also wanted to codify some uh, notions, the notion of media freedom, the notion, it's not just uh, uh, freedom of expression, but it's, it goes a step further, it's media freedom. And also to uh, codify the notion of uh, um, content of public interest as the content, as the information that can really uh, contribute to the to the to the debate to the public debate to the public sphere in democratic societies mm. yes and we will look at some of this as Teresa said ingredients of what the different stakeholders need to do to protect media freedom and democracy now and joint declaration devotes quite important part to the recommendation to the states as uh, those who have an obligation to create an enabling environment for media freedom, but also not to interfere. So, Grisha, if you could summarize for us just the main recommendations you put to the state actors, and many of them in this room and who are listening to online. Thank you, Barbara. So, the 2023 Joint Declaration includes a number of recommendations for states with a view to promoting, protecting, and creating an enabling environment for media freedom. I'd just like to highlight some recommendations of the JD. With regards to independent regulators, the Joint Declaration recommends that states should, and I quote, ensure that all public bodies which exercise powers in print, broadcast, other media, and all telecommunications regulation, including bodies that receive complaints from the public, are independent, transparent and effectively functioning in law and in practice. Furthermore, these regulators, and I quote again, should be protected from undue interference, particularly of a political or commercial nature. Regarding measures to create a vibrant media ecosystem, the Joint Declaration recommends that in addition to creating and maintaining adequately funded public service media, states should encourage a diverse and independent private broadcasting sector, in addition to supporting and facilitating minority, local and community media. Specifically regarding public service media, the JD proposes that all government or state media should be transformed into public service media without further delay. Regarding measures to protect journalists, the Joint Declaration calls on the states to adopt comprehensive measures for the safety of journalists and media workers and for the protection from violence and all forms of online and physical attacks, threats and harassment or illegitimate surveillance, emphasizing that such measures should integrate gender and intersectionality perspectives. Furthermore, states should ensure early warning and rapid response mechanism. 
continuously monitor, prevent, and act upon attacks upon journalists, in particular by promptly and fully investigating, prosecuting, and punishing all attacks against journalists and combating impunity. The JD also calls upon states to take measures to protect journalists and media outlets from strategic lawsuits against public participation and the misuse of criminal law and the judicial system to attack and silence the media, including by adopting laws and policies that prevent and or mitigate such cases and provi provide support to victims. Finally, as regards measures to support sustainability of the media sector, the JD calls upon states to develop mechanisms to support independent and investigative journalism and a broad range of news production. However, the declaration cautions that support for media should never be used to attempt to assert control over editorial independence. The JD provides examples of measures which can be taken to support media sustainability, including fair allocation of state subsidies in the media markets, allocation of public advertising, and incentivizing the contribution of large online platforms to media sustainability and a vibrant media landscape. These are some of the highlights of the JD. Yes, thank you. And actually, I want to now touch upon what Girisha just said as a, as a final kind of recommendation about media sustainability. And this also links to what Irene said about the media captures and the private sectors or private owners of the media who threaten the media pluralism and media freedom. And also the relationship with the social media who are now attracting all the revenues, but also are able to moderate and curate the content which people see online uh, produced by the media. And then also the role of media outlets themselves to protect human rights and to promote uh, trustworthy information and responsible journalism. So I wanted to ask Pedro, what are the recommendations in the joint declaration? And obviously all these topics are very vast, so we can only touch on them. What are the recommendations in the joint declaration on this subject? Thank you, Barbara. I'll do my intervention in Spanish. The joint the JD on the mandates for freedom of expression is a tradition since 1999. There, this is why we are presenting this and we are inviting you to read it. In terms of your question, Barbara, we're talking about the link between the media uh, journalism and democracy were taking back the international experience, uh, gathering the international experience about this. But there's some things I want to point out because we're interpreting the world we're living in and in our region. There is an ingredient of violence, of discrimination, of uh, exclusion. There is also some confusion that is fed by uh, misinformation. The joint declaration talks to the media and to journalism. It tells them that it would be important to move forward in transparency. As a society, we're interested in knowing where media is coming from, what are their processes for quality content, what is the current conflict of interest they may have with other sectors in society, among other things, because this ways or the absence of these yeah, is how these information and manipulators uh, filters in by showing themselves as they were, as if they were journalists or that, as if it was a journalistic work. The environment is in one in which violations of human rights are increasing. There is a deterioration of democracy. This opens up to the media and says to them, you might be our allies in the fight for human rights. You can improve your editorial criteria. You could cover more and better the uh, claims and situations where violations of human rights happened. Also, we call on plurality of the ecosystem of the media. We need all visions to be shared and heard, but also uh, in the in the media themselves, we need more diverse media that have more representation, more races, more women, uh, 
we need re represent a full representation of uh, so that the diversity of society could be represented in the diversity of media that it provides us information. We need the media to be the voice of references of this democracy uh, in decline. If we want democracy, we need to strengthen the media. So finally, in some ways, we're making a call so that the media and journalism become more empathic to our human rights because freedom of expression and freedom of the media could be rights that are enjoyed to guarantee other rights. Thank you. Thank you very much. And this is, again, as I said, just a very, very quick run through through the joint declaration. And I didn't know whether there was going to be a QA and i session. So I put on social media this topic of the joint declaration and ask people to come up with kind of associations of what they think of when they hear media freedom and democracy. And I'm going to formulate this in question to all of you and maybe just reverse the order as we said. So one question was impartiality of journalists and what does this mean? Because often impartiality as we have seen, let's say in some elections, it's covering this like fringe opinions and actually giving platform to the, in, in name of impartiality, this extreme opinions. So what should journalists do to be really impartial and not to give a platform to extremists? Yes. Okay, there is a journalism and quality, there is a paradigm of quality of information that is important to be kept and for the media to contribute to. Separate from the paradigm of verifying and do diligence, do your due diligence to verify, we need transparent and honest voices. There are many times when we understand journalism, when they tell us where you're speaking from, what is the editorial quality standards in your contents, if we're told what are the possible conflicts of interest. The lack of these elements does not mean that there is no free, free press, not at least in my opinion, but it makes it harder for the audience to believe in the media. These are some of the ingredients to revert the tendency of uh, lack of trust in the media, which is something we've discussed today as well. Thank you. And very important question was actually what Irene said at the beginning of the threat, global threat to the media freedom. And the question was that what do you say about declining protection of the media freedom in what we call traditional democracies? Because we often, when we talk about the lack of media freedom, we talk about you know China, Russia, and so on. But what about countries like US, UK, and traditional democracies? Precisely. Uh, in my view, I think we have, we, we have been aware of authoritarian states where there is no free independent media. But increasingly, we are seeing no free independent media or at least reduced free independent media in what are so-called democracies. Um, I could name a few, but I will not do so because it might embarrass UNESCO. Uh, you, but you have seen in, in my other statements, there are many, even, even in the heart of... Uh, Western democracies within the European Union, we have member states. We have here in this country another form of media control, and that is called private media barons. So there is state legislation that tightens media, weakening of laws that protect media. There is also certain factors. When media is treated as a market commodity and you let market forces decide, then what you get is the powerful occupying those assets, uh, taking mm -hmm. control of those assets. And those assets are assets of democracy. The tools of democracy then fall into the hands of certain private interests. That's extremely dangerous. And therefore, transparency of media ownership is something that we should pay attention yeah. to. Yeah. Public service media, which Teresa mentioned, is something we need to pay attention to. And public service media is not state media. Mm -hmm. It is media in the interest of the public and supported by the public, yeah. and the public interest. And these are issues that we need to focus in if we wish to preserve democracy. And that is the beauty, I think, the interest of this joint declaration is by linking media freedom and democracy, we are showing some very important indicators that are turning from green to amber to red. And there is a need on the other side to take urgent, decisive action 
to reset uh, that, those meters. And because we only have like two minutes, so to Grisha, there was also a question, and this goes to what was said at the beginning by Felipe Neto about new actors in this ecosystem, the new, like not just traditional media. So what is the recommendation for these new actors? Yes, there are new actors, and I think that uh, uh, platforms are increasingly uh, becoming uh, more and more involved in the media sector. And uh, whether there should be uh, recommendations or there should be uh, things for them to comply with, whether, and I think this is something that we are already working upon, and we will see whether there should be some recommendations on platforms as well. Yeah, and then this, uh, going back to platforms and closing with that, because the algorithms they use to profile certain content is uh, questionable, what we don't know, and there have been discussion, and also, Teresa, in your work, you have been working on artificial intelligence and the role of of artificial intelligence for journalism and whether we should work on some public interest algorithm. What, what could you say about that in one minute? Yes, <laughs> thank you very much. It's, uh, it's uh, quite, quite a task to say that in one minute, but definitely we need, uh, uh, we need uh, a much more uh, human rights-centred approach regarding uh, platforms, regarding the recommendations to the platforms. Uh, UNESCO is, uh, is now leading a process, uh, uh, a consultation process, it will be important, and I think we need a very serious, uh, uh, serious discussion about, uh, about the platforms, and, uh, because what we are witnessing right now is the states are intervening, they are regulating themselves, and uh, maybe uh, the best way to really try to have some, uh, some leadership on this process is to provide the states with guidance on how to, uh, how, to, uh, how to do this kind of intervention, this kind of regulation, and not just say, okay, it's maybe too soon. We have to be very careful uh, because really the platforms are completely changing uh, our information ecosystem. So uh, it's the most serious threat, is yeah. the most serious challenge. Yeah. And you know, you don't see that there's this like, oppressive clock in front of me and they, are, uh, they threaten us to start the music and silence us through that. So this was really just a run through the document. And tomorrow from 9.30 at the New York Bar Association, really just walking distance from, the, uh, from here in Van Center, we are gonna have a detailed discussion about these issues we touched upon, and you will have an opportunity to discuss it with special rapporteurs in a more depth. And we also have a copy of the joint declaration over there, so feel free to pick up a copy here. Denise and Jürgen are, are um, going, gonna give you a copy, and we really hope that we will see many of you tomorrow at the Van Center at 9.30 for more detailed discussion. So thank you very much and thank you also to UNESCO for hosting us. A big thank you to the special mandate holders on freedom of expression for that strong message in this year's joint declaration. Now, I know it's been a very long day, so thank you all of you in the room and those watching online for sticking with us. Um, again, please join in the conversation. The hashtag is World Press Freedom Day. Our next session focuses on press freedom and the safety of journalism, something that recently has been never far away from the headlines. And we want to discuss in the next hour the threats in particular the journalists and media face in their daily work, what we as an international community can do to ensure that journalists can go about and practice their profession safely. And to set the scene for this discussion, uh, we have uh, a fantastic guest, and it is my pleasure to invite to the stage Alma Latour, publisher of the Wall Street Journal and CEO of Dow Jones. And he is going to be interviewed by a familiar face to you all, Abdurrahim Fakara, Al Jazeera Bureau Chief. Yeah, I, 
I hope not too familiar by now, but <laughs> um, it gives me great pleasure, obviously, uh, to be here um, for this special uh, conversation about uh, uh, Evan uh, Goskovich, the Wall Street Journal correspondent currently detained in Russia. And it gives me great pleasure to be having this conversation with Almar Latour, who is the publisher of the Wall Street Journal. Um, before I start my conversation with him, I have some good news um, for us in terms of freedom of the press. Uh, this guy, Hisham Abdelaziz Gharib, is an Al Jazeera correspondent who was detained in Egypt without trial. The good news is that he was released two days ago. The bad news, however, is that this guy, Rabia Mohammed Abdul Wahd al-Sheikh, also an Al Jazeera journalist, he continues to be detained without trial in Egypt. Another piece of bad news is Bahaddin Ibrahim Namatullah, another Al Jazeera journalist who continues to be detained in Egypt without trial. And we also have the other piece of bad news is Shirin Abu Akla, the Al Jazeera correspondent who was killed a year ago, and there still has not been any justice for her. And I'm afraid I do have another piece of bad news, and that is Ivan Goskovich, the Wall Street Journal correspondent. This is a copy of the front page of the Wall Street Journal on the 31st of March, and it says Ivan Gorskovich loved Russia, the country that turned on him. And with that, I wanted to start you off. If you could talk a little bit about that, if you could talk a little bit, just remind us who Ivan is and what exactly happened to him. Well, first off, uh, thank you so much for uh, paying attention to this issue and to uh, press freedom around the world today. Uh, Evan uh, Gerskovich is a 31-year-old reporter uh, for the Wall Street Journal, um, a, a great writer deeply committed to his subject matter, which was a passion of his. His parents were Soviet Union uh, immigrants to the to, uh, the, the U.S., um, and he had a passion for learning to understand Russia um, and uh, going really deep to be able to narrate its, uh, its beauty, but also its challenges. And he did so uh, remarkably well with, uh, with uh, f phenomenal stories that he wrote. However, on one of those stories, uh, as he went out reporting as an accredited journalist uh, in Russia, he was detained, uh, taken away, and falsely charged with espionage. Uh, it happened uh, in a moment. We have uh, not um, uh, seen him uh, other than uh, on video in a glass cage during a hearing. Um, but he's been incarcerated now for four weeks plus. Um, certain protocols, uh, even with uh, false charges like espionage, were broken, where consular access to Evan was uh, uh, limited or delayed uh, significantly. Um, but we're, through letter writing and through a global outpouring of support, uh, we're also certain that Evan is getting uh, a lot of that support uh, and uh, can read the letters and we have, through his lawyers, 
that we've retained for him, Russian lawyers, uh, who, uh, who incidentally cannot uh, share anything about the case really with us. Uh, but we have heard from them that Evan is thankful and is reading every letter that he's getting at the moment. On, going on from, from that, talk a little bit about, I, I, I want you to talk a little bit about his family, but before that, talk a little bit about his colleagues uh, at the Wall Street Journal, how that's affecting them. Yes. Well, I would say there are two responses. Uh, one, of course, to see a colleague incarcerated for doing his job, uh, for being committed, for actually being good at his job and being falsely charged, that's appalling. Um, and it's a, it's a gut punch. And people are feeling that. It's personal. Uh, and there's also a bigger thought that, as a reporter, this could be you. And that stretches beyond the newsroom of the Wall Street Journal. On the other hand, there is hope. And there is a, a commitment and a resilience to do whatever it takes to bring him home. And we've seen that spirit uh, that unlocked inside the Wall Street Journal. It, I think, has been unleashed uh, on, on a global stage. Uh, with uh, people supporting this at a grassroots level, it getting a lot of attention uh, worldwide. Um, and that has uh, been helpful uh, because it certainly has gotten uh, the attention of the administration uh, and uh, third parties uh, around the world. And so I think those emotions that his colleagues have, that I as his colleague also have, they're uh, now used uh, to push for his release. You mentioned hope, and obviously that reminds, could remind us of a lot of things. One, of, one thing it reminds me of is that scene in the movie, The Shawshank Redemption, where Red says, hope is a dangerous thing, my friend. How is his family doing in terms of hope? I had the privilege of spending some time uh, with his family uh, last week, and again this weekend uh, in Washington, D.C., and they are resilient, uh, resilient uh, to such a degree that they are an inspirational force. His mother, Ella, uh, spends uh, uh, all her time uh, finding uh, out the latest and, uh, on the case, um, thinking about solutions uh, as to how his release can be secured. His father, Mikhail, um, is uh, also right there, uh, resilient. His sister, uh, Daniela and her husband, Anthony, uh, they're all united in this one goal. Uh, and of course, this is deeply emotional. This is uh, an unimaginable pain to see a loved one taken away for false charges and for merely doing his job. Um, but they are strong. And uh, that was great to see this weekend. Um, in Washington, uh, we got uh, them to connect, for example, with President Biden in a personal meeting. Talking of President Biden, um, in terms of what the U.S. administration can do to secure the release of somebody like Evan, what do you feel has been done that will positively lead to a positive outcome for Evan? Well, we are tremendously grateful to the administration for everything that has happened thus far. Uh, the administration first uh, helped declare Evan wrongfully detained, which unlocked a lot of dedicated resources ac across many different uh, governmental departments uh, to help focus on his release. Um, they have also uh, made the State Department available. We've had conversations uh, with, uh, with the White House. And there are many, many people at work within the administration to help free Evan. Now, uh, the latest this, this weekend was really uh, that the president personally committed to pushing for Evans' release. He did so publicly um, in a speech at the White House Correspondents' Dinner, um, and he connected with the family uh, himself. And so all these things are very meaningful because, as is often the case uh, with um, uh, situations like these, uh, there, 
decisions may eventually have to be made at the highest level possibly in the, in the, in the Oval Office. And so that's why it's so meaningful to see that direct engagement uh, from the administration, uh, even in the first uh, four or five weeks. Uh, earlier today, we heard from the, the Director General of UNESCO, uh, Audrey Azulay, uh, something to the extent that in a situation like this, it's not just the governments that have to do something to protect journalists, and they do, they have a responsibility to, but there are other, other actors, uh, uh, NGOs, uh, and so on. Um, how much of that are you seeing in the case of Evan? Well, effectively, within Dow Jones and the Wall Street Journal, we've set up a, a special unit that focuses on his release, uh, that has a, a legal team, that, that has outside legal counsel in Washington, that has Russian-based uh, lawyers. Uh, we have a communications team and outside firms working on a very important task of keeping Evan in the news and making people aware of his situation day by day, minute by minute. And we have people working on connecting with governments in the US and uh, third parties uh, all over the world. And so there's so much happening all at once. There's an outpouring of support. And we're trying to make sure that we explore every avenue uh, to secure Evan's release. Just to widen the circle a little bit, um obviously based on the particular case of uh, Evan. What do you think we, journalists as a whole, ought to do, ought to get done to bolster our safety and our security, especially when we go out there to cover dangerous situations? Yes. Well, the risk calculation as the, the issue of press freedom and security is getting worse. The risk calculation is changing by the day. Uh, we have a large news organization uh, and organizations like your own. You, you have to, before going in, understand what the risks are and also prepare uh, for the unexpected. However, we cannot withdraw from reporting about the world. There's probably no better answer to autocracies that are trying to squash and, and um, uh, diminish uh, journalism than to offer great journalism to the world. Um, we also, I think, as journalists have a task to share with as many people as possible that it is not just press freedom that's at stake, but that ultimately the fight for press freedom, the fight for Evans' release, is the fight for everybody's freedom. The press freedom goes, free societies go. And making people aware of the stakes around the world is a key task for journalists. And just to wrap up, to the extent that uh, Evan was, you know, we just heard from you trying to do a good thing for journalism uh, while try trying to cover events in Russia, Obviously, no good deed goes unpunished, as, as, as they say, but what is the good thing, if there's a good thing, that you think that may come out of his detention as a journalist in a country like Russia, for journalism? Well, first off, I've got to say, a cowardice move uh, that takes a journalist doing his job um, into a, a, a cell, um, is just unacceptable. And so that's not good. Uh, there, there is uh, no redeeming factor about that specifically. Uh, but if it can serve as a warning sign, then at least it gets some utility, uh, but still the price for that is way too high. Almar, on behalf of everybody in this hall, um, Thank you for coming here to share this poignant story about Evan, which, as you said, could be the story of any journalist any time in today's world. Thank you very much. It's great to see you. Thank you. Good to see you. Thanks.
Yes, I echo what Ada Rahim said just now. You know, the story potentially of any journalist, it is the reason why we are here today marking World Press Freedom Day. Um, and at this stage, I would like to invite to the stage Ms. Khadija Patel. She is a journalist in residence at the International Fund for Public Interest Media. This is a major initiative to come with emerging challenges in terms of media viability, especially in the global south. And Ms. Patel, over to you. Thank you very much. And good afternoon, everybody. Oh, it's almost evening then. Throughout the day today, we've heard about the various challenges facing news media. And when they pack together like this, it is easy to become despondent. It is easy to lose hope. But the one thing that we cannot do is lose hope. What we we must emerge from this day, from this week here in New York, is resolute, actually. And remember that the world is actually a lot different. It looks a lot different than it did 30 years ago. In South Africa, where I'm from, 30 years ago, the apartheid regime was fast crumbling. And in the months maybe even up to, I think it was maybe the year before we actually had a democratic election, I remember being in my third grade classroom with my teacher who had a radio on all day. She was listening out for news about the result of a referendum that had been held to end apartheid. Even as an eight-year-old, and this is the part where you calculate my age frantically in your heads and congratulate me for not looking a day over, the, uh, over 18. Even as an eight-year-old, without then properly understanding what apartheid was and how history was unfolding in that moment, I could feel that that radio was connecting us to something hugely significant. In the coming months, South Africa achieved something immense, freedom. And it was brought to us in moments like those. The crackle of voice on the radio, the dots on our screens, the ink on paper, the images and voices that take us to the streets to raise our voice, to chart new paths and ultimately connect us to the rest of the world. What it actually does is connect us to the sum of our humanity in real time. It is because South Africa eventually enshrined the right of freedom of expression in its constitution that I've been able to fulfill this compulsion I feel towards journalism. And I'm not sure who exactly to blame for that. It's either that teacher with the radio on or my grandfather who apparently read the newspaper to me as a baby. Um, some lullaby that was, but I do love journalism. And being a journalist, filling out the blanks of our understanding of our world is one of the best jobs in the world, I think. But it is increasingly becoming more difficult. I cannot tell you those difficulties in better language than what you've heard here on the stage today. Don't get me wrong, journalism was never an easy job and it's never meant to be easy, I don't think. And the media is far from perfect. We've never had a perfect news media. We must always endeavor to be better, acknowledge our faults, acknowledge our shortcomings. But in the sum of the endeavor of independent news media, the world has been a more peaceful, more prosperous place. What we are now confronting is a world where media organizations are contracting, the number of journalists in active employment rapidly dwindling, and with them, the number of stories in the public interest. The result is that we understand less of the complexities of who we are. We are alienated from the big decisions made in our name, and we are ultimately deprived of our human rights. 
It's not just the blunt force of autocracy that imperils freedom of expression and freedom of the press as it once did. The threats are more complex, more sophisticated, and yet in some ways, very, very simple. Right now, most news organizations in low and middle income countries are simply not able to sustain themselves. Left alone to face market forces, most organizations will not survive. And that has created a new set of realities that at once feeds autocratic impulses and makes individual journalists and institutions more vulnerable to capture. Make no mistake, we will never be able to save every institution in peril. But if we take decisive action now, we may be able to ensure that there is a healthy ecosystem that supports the resilience of news media. The response that we must accumulate requires first a commitment to the value of news media, a renewal to the commitment of its protection and an understanding that without it, we lose something of what it means to be human. I'm proud today to announce the launch of the International Fund for Public Interest Media, the first global multilateral partnership to ensure that news media does exist for the public interest. The International Fund has already raised close to $50 million, and I want to thank UN Secretary General Guterres and our hosts here at UNESCO for their early and continued support for this endeavor. We must also appreciate the efforts of some of the early financial supporters of the fund. Ambassador Power, who spoke earlier, and her team under the leadership of President Biden, with their initial contribution, have seeded this initiative. Alongside them, President Macron of France has also been a crucial supporter of this initiative, providing financial support and hosting our headquarters in Paris. We're grateful, too, for supporters like the Swiss government and the Ford Foundation, who have been essential in ensuring that this idea becomes reality. Altogether, there is now a growing global coalition supporting the International Fund. In addition to more than 15 governments, philanthropies, and corporate entities who have made a financial contribution, several states have expressed their political support for the International Fund. In recent weeks, the presidents of Moldova and Timor-Leste have personally indicated their support and agreed to join the Council of the International Fund as representatives of the top performing countries on the RSF Press Freedom Index in their regions. The challenge, ladies and gentlemen, is vast. But our ambition must be equal to it. We aim to raise at least $1 billion in financial support in the next 10 years. In this first phase of operations, the International Fund will make grants available for media organizations in four focus regions. Africa and the Middle East, the Asia Pacific region, Latin America and the Caribbean, and Eastern Europe. Overseen by an independent board led by Maria Ressa and Mark Thompson, the fund will allocate resources to organizations to become more resilient, while supporting them to innovate towards new models of enterprise. We have already completed a small-scale pilot funding round that awarded 13 pilot grants to media organizations in Brazil, Colombia, Lebanon, Nepal, Niger, Sierra Leone, South Africa, Tunisia, and Ukraine. And we will continue to work in these countries and in at least 30 others over the next two years. This is only the beginning, but it is an important beginning for the International Fund and for the world, for the future of news media. We must ensure that the ability for news media to exist is protected and enhanced. And I want to use this opportunity to reiterate a call made by Secretary General Guterres for nation states to urgently support the future of news media by raising their, commit their financial commitments to media. 
currently 0.3% cumulatively of ODA, of development assistance, is directed to news media. We want to join the call, supported by many, many others, to raise this figure to 1% over the next 10 years. This is not an insurmountable task. The challenge is vast, yes, but the resources are at our disposal to confront it. I want to ask as well that the journalists and activists assembled here join us in ensuring that we accelerate this movement, that we affirm our commitment to the value of news media. And for that, I invite you to sign a letter we have published on our website, ifpim forward slash letter, calling for international support for the protection of news media. A world without an independent public interest media would be a rather lonely one. But we have the opportunity to confront that reality right now. Thank you. Thank you to Ms. Patel there and the work that the IFPIM are doing. Now, we want to go back to build on those points we heard from Samantha Power earlier, talking about lawfare and an initiative uh, announced today by USAID, uh, the Reporters' Shield. And we want to dive deeper into the threats facing journalism today and how to address that. And so with that, please join me in welcoming to the stage Jody Ginsburg, President of the Committee to Protect Journalists, Mira Milosevic, Executive Director of the Global Forum on Media Development, Professor Song Phil Hong, member of the high-level panel of legal experts on media freedom, and Peter Norlander, Startup Director for Reporters Shield. And the moderator for this exchange is going to be Omar Jimenez, an Emmy Award-winning journalist and correspondent from CNN. It's, well, I know you guys have had uh, a, a long day, but you know what, we're going to close it out in a great way. So we've got a lot of great topics to discuss here, very serious topics, and I just want to open it up to all of you. You all are, of course, in this, in this fight to protect fre press freedoms in various aspects of, of the fight, from legal to actually working in, in coalescing organizations. So right off the bat, I just want to ask, what do you see as the biggest threats to any of those factors, including freedoms of reporters or just simply the ability to report? Jody, I'll start with you. So I was going to kick off by talking about the myriad threats that journalists face around the world, but I think after six hours, probably you're fairly well aware of them. So I wanted to talk um, about something that I've noticed as we've gone on during the day, and that's I know many of people in this room, and that's wonderful, but really what we need is for member states to show up, to be present. We've heard how important solidarity is. We've heard from journalists who have said how important it is that other states speak out when they see journalists threatened, attacked, and oppressed. And so what I think we need and what I think one of the greatest threats that we see to journalism is that people look away, and that's people here at the UN, it's people at home. Uh, globally, we can't ignore this problem, and I think one of the, the biggest challenges is we think this is something that's happening somewhere else, and it's not, it's happening here, including in the United States. Today in the United States, someone took a shot at a media outlet in Memphis. It's here, it's on our doorstep, and we need to pay attention. And to be clear, not a jab, a gunshot. Someone a gun fired shot. a weapon yeah. at, at a local station. Um, you know, Mira, I, for you, uh, in the work that you do, uh, the Glo Global Forum for Media Development, it's the biggest global community for media development and journalism supporting organizations. Uh, what is the most challenging aspect of that, just to dive a little bit deeper into it, uh, especially when you look at crisis contexts, like places like Afghanistan, uh, Ukraine, Yemen, others as well, how, how do you do your job when those added factors are, of course, complicating it? Well, I'll uh, just continue on the thread that uh, yeah. Jody uh, has started. 
and say that what we are hearing from our members and partners and journalists from especially those countries is that they are realizing that we are not in an ad hoc crisis situation uh, or a unique emergency situation. We are all now living one continuous crisis and emergency situation. And uh, even in countries that are not in conflict, even the countries that are facing a more authoritarian governments, non-democratic governments, there is a crisis of sustainability of journalism as well. And so there is a big question, how are we as international community, as governments, as UNESCO, OSCD, Media Freedom Coalition, equipped to address these challenges that are not anymore one-off and unique. And of course, we have some systems that work really well, addressing some of the safety concerns, addressing uh, um, uh, safety of journalists, addressing the legal threats, uh, but they are not uh, projected and there is no strategy for the long-term support of, for instance, those journalists that have been evacuated from Afghanistan, those journalists from Myanmar that work in exile, a lot of institutions in Ukraine at the moment. What is going to happen with all of them in two, three, four or five years? So these are some of the mechanisms that we need to work together on to make sure that we are prepared for the next crisis, that we are proactive and not uh, reactive when the crisis happens. And, and uh, Professor Song, Phil Hong, uh, obviously now you are a member of the high-level panel on media freedom, but, but you also were a member of the UN Working Group on Arbitrary Detention as well. And so just from that experience, what are some of the most common, I guess we'll call them excuses, uh, countries use to detain, and how do you navigate the various legal systems from country to country as you, know, you try to help many of these people? Well, I think this things. I think this issue has been touched upon by many um, commentators in this room before. I think. Um, well, you know, thank you for you know talking about high high level panel of legal experts on media freedom. It's an independent uh, advisory body to over 50 government members of the Media Freedom Coalition. Well, what can we do? Um, first, we have produced about four different reports you know, about establishment of a system of emergency visas. So, you know, through which we try to give and you know, offer emergency visas in cooperation with the states to, to the journalists in, in danger. And second, also uh, the development of a robust system of consular support. So when you are in a detain, uh, detention situation, um, you, you may feel two things. First, you're completely forgotten. And second, you will never get out of here. And then you know, the... Um, you know, uh, messages from outside, especially the cons something like consular support, means a lot for the survival of the journalist in pain and in danger. And, and, and I can imagine consistency becomes important because, as you mentioned, there is that feeling that as months go on, that no one is looking out for them. And, and Peter, that brings me to you. Uh, your organization uh, at Reporters Shield, you all essentially help stop people getting sued or get caught up in, in legal action. Um, so one, just explain a little bit of what you do, but even more specifically, what are some of the most common needs where you feel like we are actually making the biggest difference in these people's lives? Yeah. So what we've been listening to all day today is people talking about the legal threats that they mm. suffer. And there are so many examples that we've heard, and we all know them, all the people in this room, because we've all been working on these for a really long time. And it is really... It is now an ongoing crisis, as, um, as was just said. We, we are living that, and it's systemic. And what we want to do that's going to be different is actually offer a systemic response. And this is something that's going to benefit not just journalists, by the way. We want to protect journalism. And you know, journalism is something that is now um, exercised by human rights groups, by environmental groups, that do important investigative reports on, um, on, on the, the most fundamental issues that we face in our society today. And they're being silenced. They're being threatened by lawsuits that are launched with no other purpose than to shut them up, to drag them through years and years of legal procedures and processes that are soul-destroying, that are expensive, and that's result in self-censorship. And that is what we want to aim to end by offering a solution that will actually empower journalists to keep on doing their reporting and lessen the burden financially, emotionally, of, um, of having to defend these endless lawsuits. 
And you know, I can one, go into detail. Well, no, no, the, the, the details are, are incredible. And one thing that just comes to mind as we talk about this, obviously, okay, there, there is a physical aspect of protecting the press, of protecting reporters. But, you know, I, when I'm online, when I'm reporting today, one of the biggest threats I see is misinformation, trying to figure out how are we making sure that the situations, that growing the press field is done in a healthy way that breaks through some of that noise that I think creates dangerous situations for a lot of reporters. And so uh, I'll just go back down the line. Jerry, I don't know if you want to start with that uh, about are there efforts to try and ensure that as we grow the field of journalism or protect our journalists that it's happening in the virtual space as well as, of course, actual uh, countries and prisons? Absolutely. There are huge efforts going on to make sure that journalists are protected online as well as off. Newsrooms increasingly are aware that their journalists will be targeted online with harassment. And I think we need to be very clear about how rapidly the environment for journalists has changed. It is now not at all uncommon that local journalists reporting on what might seem innocuous stories, sport, uh, not that sport is innocuous, but um, sport, education, travel will receive death threats because they are online, their profiles are, are available and people will threaten them with attack simply for saying things that they didn't like. And, and that's the environment that all journalists everywhere are facing. And so newsrooms are becoming much more alert to the need to support their journalists to deal with those kinds of attacks. And, and there are other forms of attack, obviously, that come with that online harassment, many of which are government-led, and the smear campaigns then translate into the kinds of legal threats that Peter is talking about. And, and when we come back, I can talk a little bit about some of the ways that I think we can tackle that more broadly, in addition to things like Reporters Shield. And even as you try to build coalitions, I mean, uh, Mira, that's a, that's a big part of, of the work that you do, trying to build uh, coalitions and provide sources for funding to, to build out that future of media. How do you do that when, in some cases, there isn't even agreement on basic information? Yeah. <laughs> it's a small question, right? Yeah, very small question. Only small questions. Yeah, so, so uh, we have uh, two general uh, issues that we are trying to address. So on one end, you don't have a stable business model that provides uh, existence and survival and salaries for journalists. And on the other side, of course, you have these emerging challenges that are so numerous that, as I said before, we don't have established mechanisms to address both and also to link them. So, you know, you, if you have the safety uh, problem, uh, you also need to make sure that that journalist, if, uh, uh, you know, they, they can't perform their job, they can survive until the environment is, uh, is, is ripe for them. So what we are seeing is actually, and we have heard that before, that journalists are on the front line of addressing this uh, information disorder. And I, 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 I need to mention a couple of research data points that, that we had just recently uh, that demonstrate how big impact this has on ability of journalists to work and operate in online spaces. So we have forbidden stories that have published that between 2017 and 2022, around 20% uh, uh, of, no, one in four journalists, that's 25, in non-conflict zones was target of disinformation campaigns. And also there is a report by UNESCO and ICFJ that goes along the same lines that 20% of online violence that emerges, especially uh, against female journalists, ends up with the physical um, some kind of physical violence as well. And there is a recent report from Project Oasis and one IFRA that says that around 60% of journalists around the world have faced some kind of online violence. And when you contrast that with the fact that these big businesses, tech companies, actually do not have established mechanism for recognizing who are these credible journalists and actors online? Who are those who 
practice ethical and professional standards, then you, you face the problem, so how do you address the threats? How do you have the early warning systems? How do you have the escalation channels when we don't have that kind of power to convince these companies to create these mechanisms for us? And there are some initiatives that are now working, working to achieve this in our, uh, in our uh, community. Well, because I think as we've seen too, the, the, the things that happen online are not just solely happening online, that there are very real and, and very common bridges into the real world that, that oftentimes can, can result in, in violence. And uh, Song Phil Hong, I wanna, uh, I wanna ask you about, obviously you, you work in the legal world and trying to make sure that people are legally uh, prepared here. When, when you speak to journalists or organizations, what is the most top of mind uh, advice or recommendation that you end up having to make sure they're able to actually do their jobs? Well, first of all, I, I think identification of legal challenges. I think that is the first, you know, where you want to get started. I think it's a cyber label uh, and cyber crimes is one of, one of the most important things that you face. And secondly, also, um, well, we have seen defamation, cities, sedition, lesser majesty, and insult laws are used for, you know, as, as a way of persecuting journalists. And also, at the same time, national security law and anti-terrorism laws, that's another branch. Mm -hmm. And again, uh, disinformation laws uh, purporting to combat so-called fake news. Mm -hmm. and, and that's the third branch that we are looking at. And again, foreign agent laws, actually, which imposes additional onerous reporting requirements and administrative, administrative and criminal liability. So these are the four to five different branches of legal challenges that we uh, try to focus on. And then the solutions should come from how you look at those and how you cope with those cases at all. So, and so, uh, Peter, he, he said something interesting that, you know, as he's laying out some of the, the common charges that are levied against reporters, whether it's sedition, mm. treason, uh, espionage, whatever it might be. Uh, how do you try to prepare for that on the front end? How do you work with that knowing that in some cases these are charges being used as opposed to actually being able to say that yeah. there's some suspicion here? Look, the problem is, is that it's so easy to bring a case against a journalist. Um, there are civil laws and defam well, there are all the laws that, um, that that have just been mentioned. So I won't I won't repeat all of them. And it's so hard to defend those laws if you're a journalist because you are going to be intimidated. You don't you, you're like oh my god you know I've got a legal letter from a firm of lawyers or word you know I've got the police knocking on my door. So what we're then trying to develop, building on the networks that already exist, because this is you know we're, we're not starting from scratch here. We're we're ramping up um, something that you know. The, the foundations for which are already there. We want to make sure that a lawyer can then, t that, that a journalist can then turn to a trusted figure, a lawyer. There's always a, a group of lawyers in any country that's, that, that defend these cases. They, um, they face high demand and they're underpaid and, and those are some of the things that, 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 we want to, that we want to address. But we want to also make, sh you know, roll out training for these lawyers. We want to roll out pre-publication advice to journalists to make sure that if they publish something that is potentially risky, um, that is potentially high risk, in fact, that they can choose, you know, phrases that are that are li less likely to get them sued. So there are all these preparatory steps that we that we can go through, and then if somebody does get sued, we want to make sure that 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 journalism organisation then has the at least. Um, the comfort of mind to know that they've got some good lawyers that, that have their back and that, and that are going to stand up for them. Um, and that's going to make a big difference. And, you know, it goes to what we were talking about before, that knowing that someone is there to stand up for them when they're toiling away for, mm. for months, yeah. wondering, yeah, yeah. not being able to see that, that daily contact. And it, and it makes me think of something uh, that your organization does, Jody, with the Committee to Protect Journalists. Is, so today, Dow Jones submitted a letter to the UN Special Rapporteur calling for an urgent appeal to the Russian Federation on behalf of Wall Street, journalist, uh, Wall Street Journal reporter Evan Gershkovich. But when I, when I scroll your website, uh, I can't help but notice how many cases there are across the world. And not all of them get the same spotlight, uh, but it's not just arrests, it's killings, it's detentions. How do you try to ensure that these cases still have attention on them, that they remain in some sort of spotlight so that they're not lost into the wind or as we've talked about, that big fear of being forgotten? 
So at the Committee to Protect Journalists, we have an incredible network that really tries to raise awareness and show solidarity locally. That's really important. We've heard it time and time again that people feel that they are not forgotten. So to raise awareness locally and then to bring those cases some international attention. And, and if we think about the things that can be done concretely to keep journalists safe and to keep journalism operating, it's... it's a number of things. It's creating enabling environments so that we can have a pluralistic media, making sure that media can be funded, a free and independent media. It's ceasing the kind of lawfare that we've talked about, the targeting of journalists using a wide variety of spurious charges. We've heard a number today, but I want to, to reiterate cases like that of Jimmy Lai. He's here. I know his son Sebastian is in the audience. Um, it's imperative that we see the UK in particular. Jimmy Lai is a UK citizen. It's imperative that we see the UK take a stand on imprisoned journalists like Jimmy Lai, that we see the international community take a stand in the case of Jose Ruben Zamora, whose son is also here, that we see the international community take a stand on the case of Evan Gershkovich. So that's one area. We want to see, we need to see law enforcement properly trained so that they don't target journalists. You, you know yourself having been arrested live on air, what it's like when the police uh, don't know the, their own laws and, and target journalists. We need to see much more use of targeted sanctions. That's something that member states here can do when they see press freedom being curtailed by other uh, states. And we need to see emergency visas and safe refuge and support for the journalists who are forced to come out so that they can continue to do their work. One of our former award winners at CPJ, Mohammed Masayed, called this an investment in truth yesterday when he spoke to a panel. It's really important that we're supporting the ecosystem when it cannot operate at home. And the last thing I would say as, as we're here in the United States, one thing that United States concrete could usually do is drop the charges against Julian Assange uh, it's a charge that, if brought to fruition, could effectively criminalise journalism everywhere, for journalists everywhere, and that's, that would send a really important, I think, and powerful message. And that goes to what you were talking about, how, you know, it's not just in countries that are seeing major, major societal conflict. In, in many cases, there, there are situations that are still either ongoing or could be improved in regards to, let's just say, the American police, where in a lot of cases, you may see one example of, of one entity getting away with something and it may give other people uh, ideas. We are short on time, so I wanna ask you all one closing question uh, because you all come from different perspectives and I'm interested to hear. To end on somewhat of a positive note, uh, it's tough in this field sometimes, but based on your fields and areas of expertise, do you have key recommendations to, to promote an environment where journalists can exercise their their profession safely and contribute to ensuring freedom of expression as an enabler of all other human rights. And I'll ask you to be brief, I'm sorry. Yes, so uh, as we have heard all day, the challenges are large and huge and uh, multiple. Uh, so this is the community that actually supports those enabling environments and journalists around the world. We still invest under 0.3% uh, of international aid budgets into this field. And for us to be able to do all these things, to protect journalists, to provide their survival until we find that business model that will work, that has to change. Also, we need to work together to prepare the principles and standards for supporting journalism that work in this new age of crisis and emergency that is ongoing. And that is something that we need to do together. We are working with the OSCD uh, and UNESCO and other institutions to uh, create principles for effective uh, media development and journalism support so that we have some recommendations for all those who uh, want to help journalists and this community. And finally, working together and uh, coordinating, making sure that there is no duplication, talking to each other within the institutions and between institutions is my final recommendation. Of course. Do you have a quick recommendation? Yeah, I think it's very important to make a distinction between the situations and scenarios of situations. First of all, um, under repress and repressive regimes, in the detention area, I mean, things are getting worse. I'm, I'm sorry not, not to be able to give you a positive note on it, <laughs> but I see 
Uh, in the uh, UN, you know, when I was at the UN, we have five cases of scenarios of uh, arbitrary detention. And then media freedom related is related to category two, which means 20%. But when I, when I was leaving, I saw about 40 to 45% of the detention were related to media freedom. Thing. Yeah. And, and increase of female, female numbers of female reporters and, and increasing number of families shattered, getting shattered. And also, to, especially the situation under which the, um, uh, the detainees, uh, detainees are placed are getting worse than before. Yeah. And, and then we, look, we need to look at, at the democratic, more in you know, democracies, a more freer societies. Still there are violations and imprisonments of uh, human rights. Then, then we have to come up with and cope with new approaches and, and developments as well. Yeah. So I think, and then uh, we need to be very careful about what we are talking about. I mean, getting people out, that's one thing, and then make them uh, continue their yeah. work as a journalist, that's another thing. Of course. And then, so I think it depends on the scenarios and we yeah. should be more careful and more, you know, um, discreet about what we do. Yeah. All right, Peter, you got 30 seconds so for your recommendation. Yeah, <laughs> I've started already. <laughs> Everybody should join us. We're a membership organization and we can actually stump up the tens and sometimes hundreds of thousands of dollars that you're going to end up paying in lawyers' fees um, to resolve your legal problems. This sounds like an advert almost, but <laughs> you, you, this is something really novel. It's been set up to be sustainable, together with the seed money that was um, announced earlier. We're launching it together. Um, we're, we're launching it at the Van Center for International Justice, who have been an important, who have been a crucial partner in devising this together with OCCRP tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. It's going to be after your breakfast and before the other sessions. That's your date. It's at um, 42nd West 44th Street, just up the road here between 6th and 7th Avenue. There no, no, no but, but, but in all seriousness, together we are stronger. Um, and, and I think we talked about coalitions earlier, and this is an important coalition that we're trying to build here. And so through membership of this, we can build a pool that will help us withstand the onslaught that we're facing. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you all so much. And I want to briefly open the floor to the Austrian uh, delegation. Oh, I'm sorry. Did I leave Jody? No, no? that's fine. I mean, I, no, I think I made my point. So. Go, give Austria some free All right, speech. all right. Jody, not forgotten. You had great comments. Uh, but I do want to open the floor uh, briefly to the Austrian delegation, who I understand uh, is making a brief statement. Yep. Thank you. Um, thank you, moderator. Um, just a few remarks on behalf of the um, permanent mission of Austria. Uh, free, independent, and pluralistic media based on freedom of information and expression form the backbone of democratic societies. In fact, freedom of the media is essential for the protection of all other human rights, as we've also heard already today. Uh, the protection of the freedom of expression constitutes a centerpiece of Austria's human rights agenda. Last year, we organized a high-level multi-stakeholder conference in Vienna, revitalizing the UN plan of action on the safety of journalists and the issue of impunity. Uh, into alia by a robust set of recommendations and a declaration supported by over 50 states. This year, we will honor the importance of the commitments the international community made 75 years ago by adopting the Universal Declaration, translating it into concrete steps at the World Conference in Vienna in 1993. And in June this year, Austria is organizing, therefore, a commemorative event uh, to this end putting prominent human rights defenders, among them journalists, into the limelight and giving them a voice. Uh, let me conclude by underlining uh, that protecting the media is crucial to protect democracy. Uh, the safety of journalists as well as unhindered access to information are essential for the realization of the universal, inalienable right to freedom of expression and of the media. And of course, Austria remains fully committed to this cause. And, you know, we must take action wherever we can in order to strengthen media freedom. Thank you. Thank you so much. And thank you to all of you for, for tuning into this conversation. Hope that you all have been enriched by not just today, but tomorrow, acknowledging World Press Freedom Day. And uh, thank you all. Have a great night. I want to thank all of our last speakers.
last panelist today. I know it's been, uh, as Omar said, a long day, so thank you for sticking with us. Uh, obviously, we have had a lot to get through. We've had moments reflecting on sort of some of the challenges ahead, but also some of the light uh, and the moment of hope. And with that, I would like to invite to the stage the Assistant Director General of UNESCO for Communication and Information, Torfik Jalasi, to address a few closing words to the participants of today's event. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, esteemed guests, dear colleagues, it has been a great pleasure for us to gather here today to officially celebrate together the 2023 Global Conference on WordPress Freedom Day. I would like first to express our gratitude to all of you present here and to those connected online for your level of engagement, for your commitment, and I would like in particular to thank the renowned speakers for sharing with us their perspectives and insights. As it was already said, the 2023 edition of the conference is highly symbolic. We are celebrating the 30-year anniversary since the UN General Assembly proclaimed May 3rd of every year as World Press Freedom Day. Therefore, this year, we have brought the event back to its birthplace under the theme Shaping a Future of Rights, Freedom of Expression as a Driver for All Other Human Rights. We open the day this morning with a performance from spoken word poet Jay Ivey, who reminded us that words have power, that words educate. These words reverberate with a shared struggle for press freedom, for journalists, for poets, and for all artists. Over the course of today's sessions, we have debated, alerted, advocated for, celebrated, and identified responses to current major challenges in the area of press freedom. Several of our speakers shared moving personal accounts that underscore the link between freedom of expression and other human rights. Today was also the occasion of several important announcements on concrete initiatives to support press freedom globally. USAID Administrator Samantha Power presented the reporter's shield to provide legal protection for investigative reporting and help defend media outlets against vexatious lawsuits. The special mandates on freedom of expression and media freedom launched a joint declaration on media and democracy, and the presidents of four United Nations bodies released a joint statement. We'll continue these discussions this evening over the awarding of the annual UNESCO Guillermo Cano World Press Freedom Prize. This unique prize within the United Nations system recognizes a person, an organization, or an institution that has made an outstanding contribution to the defense and or the promotion of press freedom anywhere in the world, and especially when this has been achieved in the face of a great danger. Today's events are part of a wider celebration taking place throughout this week here in New York City, but also numerous celebrations happening all over the world. UNESCO and its partners have organized over 40 sessions in New York City, 
at venues like Columbia University, the New York Times, the Committee to Protect Journalists, and many more. I encourage you to visit the website of the World Press Freedom Day to see the complete list of these side events taking place tomorrow and for the reminder of this week. Thank you all for your shared commitment to freedom of expression and to press freedom. This conference is about to close, but of course, the World Press Freedom Movement and community are not to stop here. I am now very glad to announce that Chile will be hosting next year's World Press Freedom Day conference in May 2024. <laughs> UNESCO is grateful for Chile's long-standing commitment to press freedom, the safety of journalists, and access to information. We firmly believe that they will prove a valuable partner in the co-organization next, uh, next year of this important global event. Thank you for your attention. Thank you for those words, Assistant Director General of UNESCO, Torfik Jalassi. Um, and at this point, I would like to invite to the stage the representative of the host of the next 2024 World Press Freedom Day Global Conference, Her Excellency, Ms. Camilla Vallejo, Minister Secretary General of the Government of Chile. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. It's so, it's so exciting to be here. I am so happy to be here representing my country, Chile, the government of Chile, and to have been part today of a um, very intense and enriching workday at the United Nations headquarters. Today reminds us of how important it is uh, today, the world, uh, the, uh, the, the, the World Press Freedom Day. The freedom of the press is the, ba is the base for building more fair and more sound societies. You all know I come from Chile. Chile is a very long and beautiful country in the south of the world. It is rich in cultures and cultural diversity in a country that has deepen its democracy, but it has many challenges to face. Let me show you a video that we prepared for this special event that will show you the challenges. Many think, many think that Chile is at the... Es el fin. Chile es el comienzo. Bosques profundos y milenarios que comenzaron con la vida. Desiertos y salares que impulsarán futuro, ciencia y desarrollo. Chile y su gente, su alegría y sus anhelos. Su compromiso firme con la democracia. Con todas sus voces, con toda su diversidad. Avanzando con fuerza sin olvidar su historia. Creemos en un futuro sustentable que cuida a las personas y al medio ambiente que con cariño protege a los suyos y se conecta con el mundo, abriendo puertas de intercambio y trabajo internacional, proyectando al mañana el trabajo que hacemos hoy. Avanzamos con entusiasmo entre ríos y glaciares, con talento e innovación, escuchando todas las opiniones con libertad, con responsabilidad y sin dejar a nadie atrás. Con niñas, niños, jóvenes, personas mayores, todas las generaciones, trabajadores y trabajadoras, emprendedoras y aventureros. Hoy vamos todas y todos hacia un mejor futuro. Algunos creen que Chile está al fin del mundo. Pero Chile es el comienzo. Gobierno de Chile, presentes por un mejor futuro. Bueno, desde... 
Thank you. On behalf of Tilly, thank you, thank you. As the video said, from Tilly, which is the beginning, I come here to thank you for the trust that UNESCO is giving us today by nominating us the country to host the World Press Freedom Day on 2024. I know this is a challenge to prepare such a high-level event. I want you to know that we're taking this responsibly, not just because we are celebrating 70 years since Chile became a member of UNESCO on the 7th July to 1953, which set us on the important path of working together. We take this with responsibility, historical responsibility because this nomination happens in the framework of the celebration of 50 years of the coup d'etat in 1973 in our country. This initiated one of the most, the darkest and uh, most horrible periods of our history. It forces us to look at the old challenges and the new challenges to our democracy, our debt, in terms of human rights, in truth, justice, and reparation. It also invites us to reflect on the right to have a free, independent, and plural press, the right to the freedom of expression, and the right to information. I cannot uh, neglect to remember Jorge, Jose Guerrasco Tapia, a great journalist that when he was 43 was kidnapped and killed on September 8, 1986. Killed at the cemetery Park, Parque del Recuerdo, remembering Carlos Bergia, attorney, lawyer, who at 30 years old, 30, only 30, was uh, uh, shot outside of the city of Calama, or Rodrigo Rojas de Negri, a media professional who was burnt alive on July 2nd, 1986. All murdered by a dictatorship that left wounds and scars in our society. They, as, and many others, not just in Chile, and in the, but in the whole world, journalists, communicators that fought and continue to fight for freedom, democracy, for truth, and for human rights. These are the people who remind us how essential communication workers are in the defense and protection of our democracies, in the defense of life. It is them whom we want to especially acknowledge and celebrate. Let us give them a round of applause to all these men and women that have fought. This nomination is very significant because next year we will celebrate 30 years since in 1994 we signed in Santiago de Chile the Santiago Declaration on the Development of the Media and Democracy in Latin America and the Caribbean. In 1994, when Chile had just finished its first government of an uh, new democracy, freedom of press, the dif diversity of media, and the rights of to communication and information were inevitably at the center of our debates. At the time, countries said that the freedom of expression is the uh, is the. Uh, uh, stepping stone to a democracy, and democracy is necessary for peace and development within and outside our countries. How significant it is that today we are announce announcing Santiago del 30 to celebrate the World Press Freedom Day 2024. 30 years have passed since the Santiago Declaration. Of course, Chile has changed. Our country has grown significantly. We've uh, made progress in the, com in the fight against inequality, in strengthening our democratic institution, in diversity and inclusion. Inclusion with a gender uh, perspective. 
and in sustainable development to protect the environment. A few days ago, President Gabriel Boric was announcing the national strategy on lithium to, in fact, develop a sustainable lithium industry with added value. But we must also acknowledge that there are many challenges ahead for in for our country filament. These are difficult times. We must learn as well as provide answers to the new and the old social demands. In 2023, when we commemorated 50 years since the coup d'etat, we can say Chile is moving forward towards uh, the building of a better future. There are difficulties, but it is possible. The future that is built every instant requires us to learn from the past. We must always value in its full magnitude democracy and respect for human rights, even though sometimes some people tell us that priorities are different. At a time when societies have suffering authoritarian uh, um, authoritarianism, we must reaffirm the importance of their freedom of expression, the exercise of a free press, protect them, and the right, protect the right to information. We must question powers. It's also relevant, particularly when we are trying to fight against uh, disinformation and hate speech. Facing these new threats to democracies, we must question whether digital platforms that many billions of people are using are spaces for information or disinformation. Are these places to meet each other in our diversity, or are these places to divide us according to algorithms that so very few can manage or understand? We must question whether this is allowing inclusion or is it reproducing hate and discrimination? Discrimination towards specific communities or big majorities like women, gender diversity, elderly people, others. This is a time when we must reflect on the challenges that the new ways of media concentration facing different audiences and their demands. We must think about the new ways in which we try to restrict and uh, attack journalists and communicators who have sometimes lost their lives just because of doing their job. Gabriel Boric's government is convinced that we must continue with these debates and that we need to talk worldwide as to how to continue to guarantee and strengthen the rights of uh, the related to communication and information. This means that we must have journalism and diversity in the media. We understand that that means we must have better democracies. Of course, we have to have public debate that are more that is more responsible, especially by those who have the responsibility of being public authorities. While we know that we cannot find all the answers, we are convinced that the problems of democracy will always, always have to be resolved with more democracy, not less. This is why the challenge of celebrating the World Press Freedom Day 2024 in Santiago Plaza 30 fills us with joy and pride and invites us to provide the best conditions so that we can have debates with academia, politics, civil society representatives, and to promote the exchange of ideas. We are offering Chile as an open space for reflection and fraternal dialogue as a 
place that is eager to learn about different perspectives. A country that is open to possibilities to have the debates we need today, and especially as a land which will never give up in their promotion of the freedom of the press, the diversity of the media, and the guarantee of the rights to expression and information so that we can strengthen our democracies. This is why you can always count on our country, our history, and our people. Thank you. And Tofik Jalasi to come to the front of the... Uh, this is a moment for photographers to kind of capture this handover uh, and this moment before we conclude our program today. And that brings to a close this 30th anniversary edition of World Press Freedom Day. Thank you so much, everyone, for being here today um, and showing your support at this crucial time for defense of freedom of expression and its ties to human rights. Thank you very much. Good evening. <laughs>